Welcome, 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 welcome to the last podcast of 2018. It's incredible. It's been a rapid oh, year. I cannot believe that we're already at the end of the year. I've just, I've just remembered when, when we were sorting out our notes for how we were going to do the intro and what this podcast is going to be about. That I promised on the last podcast that you were going to tell people what you'd been doing and why I was doing the intro by myself. Yeah, that's a good point. Did you, you had a good trip. I did. I was in Austria, first time there. I um, arrived very late on the. And I leave very late last week, basically. It was on the Wednesday, the Wednesday, Wednesday morning and, you left. Yeah, and so basically I arrived at one in the morning. And it's always a bit terrifying when you go to another country and you, you're driving on the other side of the road to what you're used to. And to make matters worse, it was snowing quite heavily when I arrived and the dead of night. Uh, but their roads are pretty good over there. So that took a little bit. If it had been, if it'd been like the West coast of Scotland doing that journey, it would have been horrendous be like death. because the roads would have been a meter in snow by then. And the you, said you, were, you were impressed with the Austrian efficiency for it, clearing roads. It was bloody efficient. I have to say they, they don't mess around at all. They know how to keep the country running when snow comes. In fact, I don't think they even blink an eye. And I've noticed that everywhere else in Europe that kind of has snow, and we get it here, they just, it's just a normal thing for them. And then in the UK, it just social... um, It only has to be a threat of snow. A threat of snow. And the only way I can describe it last year was if a zombie apocalypse was a way to happen. That's how people (laughs) behave. We ran out of fuel, we ran out of milk, we ran out of bread. Mm. Uh, Bearing in mind that there's no, yeah, it was bad, but it was probably only maybe two days that, People couldn't get into a town or something. Um, I don't go into town for weeks at a time. Today was the first time that I went into our local town, Brecon, for about two months because that was the last time I had my hair cut. <laughs> the, to, to haircut, is that, that's that, how so, you define your, so your town that, that is literally the last time I was in a reasonable... I'm not classing Edinburgh because I go there for the rugby and I don't actually go shopping or anything when there. It's literally bar, rugby, home. Mm. So that doesn't count. Well, they're very upset and I think this has been happening around the country. They're very upset in our local community right now because of all the council parking charges. Yeah, 22 years it's been for free in, uh, in our local community and now they've um, added parking charges. So now the struggling high street shops are struggling even more. Which because is Because people are buying online even more than they did before because they don't want to pay for the, the parking. Ugh. In a place that n- never really had a parking problem. But it was never about a problem. No, it, was it was about, about raising, raising money. Fun. They yeah. want to raise 700 grand a year. And in the first two months, the local community or certain individuals decided that they didn't want the parking meters there. So they set them all on fire at the cost of, of thousands of pounds. So I don't think the council are going to make their money this year. We'll see. It, there certainly seems to be a unified approach across the entire town. Because as I noticed today, when we were both in town this morning, literally every local shop has the big yellow posters in. The, the thing underneath. I'm confused about, the whole purpose of councils and government is to make services run and they are there for the people. So I don't understand when you have such a a large amount of people saying this is not what the I community wants. I think they misjudged wants. it, I think is the key. Um it's just it's quite interesting, isn't it? Well hopefully the yeah, hopefully the businesses don't suffer. As running a small business ourselves, we don't rely on footfall fortunately, but I can imagine how painful it must have been. Well I noticed the council buildings still have free parking though. Outside the yeah, front of there, I don't think you can go park there and then go shopping there. My, my point being is that it, or it, things generally happen to someone that it doesn't affect. It's yeah. like roadworks when when people do really serious roadworks. The person that made the decision <laughs> about them being extended for a year because they've done a really crap job or something, they don't live in that area because they're not mm-hmm. affected by it. Two more interesting things on this show. 
get, being that it's the last show uh, before Christmas, and in fact, the last show of 2018, as Daryl said, you're not going to be hearing from us again until uh, the week of the 6th of January. And we've already recorded that podcast. It is ready to go. Um, so you're going to be hearing from uh, the lady who is the design brain behind Modern Huntsman. So that'll be the first show of 2019. This show, we're keeping with tradition for the last three years because uh, we're going to give you a kit rundown which is just, generally speaking, the, the stuff that we've used, be that hunting, camera gear, just the things that we use in our sort of day-to-day -day work and recreation that we like or think we're going to like, because some of, some of the things on my list I haven't actually had for all that long, but I think I'm, I'm going to mention them to everybody listening so that you can go and check it out. And then at the end of our entire kit rundown, We've got a, it's actually probably not all that short, half an hour, 40 minute podcast uh, with Sarah Farnsworth, who's been on the show before. She is an incredible field sports photographer. She won, she forgot to mention it when I asked her what was the highlight of your year. Uh, she forgot to mention that she won Leica Field Sports Photographer of the Year. Yes, she the did. Overall <laughs> category. There's lots of little different categories. Uh, it was tough because winner. she was against us. <laughs> Dar Daryl won <laughs> one of the, the stalking category, didn't you? Yes, it did. But yeah. She won the overall photographer. So she is phenomenal. A lot of you will know who she is already. Uh, she has Instagram and, and Facebook, and you're going to hear from her now. A lot of it is about uh, kit and equipment and how she uses it. So it's quite appropriate that it's in this podcast. Are we, we going to do our bit first, and then she's going to come on, or? I, and I think she can go on at the end. Okay, she can go on at the end. That's yeah. fine. She, we'll, she can wrap up, wrap the, up year the wrap us. up the year. Uh, I was just going to say I didn't actually talk about Austria at all. I kind of sorry, I we got sidetracked. Side sidetracked by talking about roads and infrastructure yeah. within the UK and the meltdown that is the UK. <laughs> okay, so carry on because you haven't even said what you were there. No, for. so I, the, I got as far as driving yeah. to location. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was I was doing a job in Austria, and for the life of me, I don't know where I actually was. I could point to it on a map, but I couldn't actually you say. You flew into Salzburg, didn't you? Yes, I did. And then it was two hours east of there. And then we were in this amazing ground. Uh, uh, Austria simply blew me away. I didn't know really. It was a very last minute job. So I didn't really. About four days' notice? Yeah, so I did, didn't, hadn't really given any thought about where I was going. It was just a case of get on a plane and go there. And so I'd done zero research. We had one of our good friends, Andrew Banks, he'd been there for the last two years doing skiing. And he said it was phenomenal. And when I arrived, I can see why he was saying that the mountain terrain was absolutely stunning and it helped that they just had two meters of snow just before I arrived. And uh, so I was doing a photo shoot. Well, it wasn't just a photo shoot. It was filming and photography um, for a client out there. And we spent two days doing that and they were hunting chamois. And for you, that was the first time you'd ever seen Shamwell. Yep, first time I'd cool ever seen. Cool critter. V very cool, very cool. Um, you know, the, the terrain was very steep, uh, quite dangerous in places because of the snow. And we weren't skiing; we were just wading through the snow up to your waist. Uh, but yeah, they they seemed pretty used to it. They had these long, big poles that they would walk with. Um, yeah, there's, there's and like with alpine mountain with a, poles, yeah, yeah, alpine with a big spike on it to go through the snow. So, I think. That for them that was fairly normal to hunt in those those kind of conditions with no skis or anything mm. and i don't think skis would have worked in some of the too house steep. too steep and i was a baron actually saw some of the pictures one of the chamois was shot in this massive valley i don't know if some people might have seen online the um the box the tree stand mm. that it was kind of like the last tree stand before you enter the oh, the one you put on Instagram the steep mountains, okay. and it was shot from there, and it was on the opposite side of a valley, and it was so dangerous to extract it that the guide actually managed to drive a tractor up the mountain with big snow chains on uh, through a, like a forestry track all the way up to where we were, and the reason why I did that is because getting it back up the other side of the gorge required a winch, so he kind of did this big route round, put a winch onto it so it could be winched back back up. It, yeah, it, it's not easy going because someone you still said has their professionalism was amazing. Yeah, so I mean, someone still had to walk behind the animal, walk, but they were kind of attached to the winch, walking up to make sure it didn't get caught on trees and amazing. things. But that's how steep it is. Uh, it, normally, because I asked them about. Obviously, if you're further out in the mountain, would you cut it up? And they said, yes, they would cut it up. But those animals were actually being processed for um, the hotel. Mm. So they kind of didn't they want to take them as a whole carcass. They wanted to take it in as a, a whole thing. They were being and made into sausages. 
one of the things that you were telling me when you got back, which I found really interesting, is how ingrained and accepted in the culture there hunting was. It wasn't something that was separate. It was just it was the same as somebody enjoying football with somebody who was a hunter. Yeah, from my view of it, it was when I spoke to them, they seemed to think they have problems. Mm. Uh, and they seem to think in Germany as well, because we were there with German clients, they have problems about you know societal change. But when I'm looking at it, I think their problems are not that great. Not coming from the UK, from going the UK, there. Yeah. I think we have a lot more. We have more problems in different areas, a lot more different areas. It's uh, the the difference between hunters and non-hunters is the gap is bigger. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, here than over there. You know, small things like the back of my hotel, They, the guy that owns the hotel evidently just processed all his animals in plain view of, of the hotel because there was a massive um, like winch to yeah. hang animals up. And, and You'd never get away with that here. You'd never get away with that here. And, you know, they would they would walk you know down the road with their rifles and their slips over the back. People mm. don't even have a second glance. That's yeah. kind of... Uh, and they ask you, you know, when you go in the hotel, people you don't even know, oh, how was hunting today? And They want to know. They want to know, yeah. Well, how did you get... You know, how was it? So it was it was good. And the food was good at the hotel as well. Excellent. Good Austrian food. I had schnitzel <laughs> one night. <laughs> It'd be disappointing if you didn't, really. <laughs> yeah. uh, it looked like an incredible trip. And the pictures, which don't none of them are up yet. We haven't no. shared them with anybody. Um, I look incredible. And then my flight back was a bit hellish. I took four airplanes to get home, and it took me 24 hours to get home, which was normally a four-hour flight. I didn't envy you that at all. It was, yeah, it was, you know what? It was one of those things where I wasn't actually stressed one little bit. Because it doesn't help. No, because it didn't help, and there was nothing I could do. And I, there was some stress people there. I, you know what I think it is? I think you're more stressed if you're going on holiday than work. Yeah, maybe. Because with work, okay, yeah, there might be stress if you can't get to a job. But if you're going home, you just accepted that it's part of the job. It's part of the job. You're delayed. There's nothing you can do. Going about out it. to a job is different though, because you don't know what, what you're going to miss, and suddenly yeah, you're exactly. delaying everything. Not that it's your fault. Uh, but, but yeah, the so I mean, my first flight was delayed by an hour my second flight we got on no the second flight was delayed by two hours and that's because the crew couldn't make it from munich to frankfurt and then they found another crew and we then taxied out onto the runway and i thought we were away to take off and then they powered down the engines and we taxied back into the runway and they then said that they had to de-ice the plane but to add to an extra problem the crew had then done too many hours flying that day and there wasn't a spare crew, so they got us all off the plane, cancelled that flight. They then found a BA flight for about six people from my flight. And what I didn't realise is that half the plane that I was on were people from the previous day trying to get home because their flight was cancelled for basically the same thing. And then I got on the BA flight, and the BA flight was <laughs> then delayed by t uh, about an hour. And then we arrived in Heathrow Terminal 5. We weren't meant to go through there. And... When we landed, the bridge in Terminal 5 broke down halfway across Come on. Uh, to, you know, so we could get off the plane. Yeah. And we were on the plane for 40 minutes on At the At this ground. point, you're just like, I will jump. No, I'll I get off. Like, it's okay. I was like, you know, you can't make it up anymore. No. You can't make it up. <laughs> Have you found your suitcase yet? No, it's still not here. Is it even in the country? I believe it's in Glasgow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we eventually got off once they fixed the bridge in Terminal 5 to get another flight to Glasgow. And that flight was delayed by another two and a half hours uh, to Glasgow. So I got back home about four o'clock in the morning and with no luggage as well. That had gone. Bear in mind that the flights were all delayed. You know, it all came from Germany. So they literally had like nine or ten hours in Germany to get my bag on one plane. And they It'll failed to do it. will be space though. Uh, probably space. Because that happened to me the one time. Well, my main concern is uh, there's a bottle of alcohol in there. <laughs> and I hope that that's not broken. Uh, hopefully not, because it's not a really... But glass is quite hard to break, you know, when you press on... You say that now, you haven't got your bag yet. No, I don't. Well, it'll smell like... But anyway, you, you, got, you got back, which is good. And at some point, there'll be a film out, and there's also going to be a lot Not of about my journey. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, about the more exciting part, yeah. the hunting. And we will be sure to, to share that with everybody uh, when we can, when it's out, because yeah. I think it'll be going out on YouTube for the clients, judging by the um, rest so. of the films. Yeah, I think, I think so. so. This podcast is coming to you only one week after the last one. So this is actually an extra show. And it is being brought to you by 
the guys at Scott Country International, which is your go-to place for anything thermal, night vision, electronic in the world of outdoors pursuits. Yep. And they, they've become renowned for it. They also do have some other gear because I'm actually going to mention one of one of it later on as well. They so. do. They've in the last couple of years they've kind of expanded the array of equipment that they have that uh, have so sort of from clothes to rucksacks to trail cams. Yeah. Um, so go over and check out their websites, uh, scottcountry.co.uk. And if you want to look at what we are just about to tell you about, it's scottcountry.co.uk forward slash pace brothers. Easy forward slash pace brothers. The link will be below in the description of the show. So we have uh, just a handful of items, which when we first started recording this podcast, weren't, weren't going to be in stock until tomorrow. But I've just spoken to Paul at Scott Country, and he told me that they are there. They're, they've arrived. So as soon as you listen to this, you will be able to go onto the shop and order it. Um, so the first thing to bring up is the Pulsar Accolade um, LRF XP50 Thermal Binocular. And the equivalent of that, which if I just scroll down my screen here, which is the, the LRF XQ38. The difference between the two being one's in standard definition and one's in high definition. But what is different, well, one of the, the main and most obvious aspects that makes this different to most other thermal spotters is that it is in fact a binocular and not a monocular. Most people, including myself, I don't actually think I've ever used a binocular thermal spotter. No, I don't think so. Uh, are used to using just small handheld monoculars. And it can put quite a lot of strain on your eyes. Normally when you put it down, you're kind of blinded in one eye and you can see through the other. Uh, but this removes that issue because you're looking through two eyepieces like a pair of binoculars, but it has a single objective lens. So that is just shows you how far it's come in the last few years. It always amazes me how f how far and fast the technology in night vision and thermal moves. Um, but this is the next evolution of that. So that's the yeah thermal binoculars. And you've got something up next, Tom? I do indeed. Then this one is a pretty damn good price, I have to say. It's the Pulsar Apex LRF Q XQ50 Thermal Rifle Scope. And right now it's got 21% off at... £2,739. It is actually nuts because I remember probably about five or six years ago testing for the magazine the very first commercially available thermal rifle scope and it cost £8,000. And you can have this now. And this has got the rangefinder yeah. on it. It's just can you nuts. imagine that? A thermal scope <laughs> in like with five a range or six years. Rangefinder for under three grand. Now, if you want everything this has and a bit more then the the pulsar trail so the one that Darrell just mentioned is the kind of the, the kind of the basic package for the the thermal rifle scope uh, which is the apex but the trail comes in the xp50 and the xq50 and the difference between those two codes is one standard definition one's high definition but it has things like uh, a better built-in battery pack so you you can charge it has its own batteries whereas the apex uses the cr12 my can't read my writing i think it's 123 or 127 it uses an external battery or is a, a, a battery, a disposable battery, or you can you can plug an external battery pack onto it. You don't have to worry about any of that with the trail because it comes with it, with its own battery system. Uh, and the other thing is it has all the kind of niceties. It has the, the Wi-Fi. It has built-in video recording. All yeah, those, those cool. cool bits of... The extra, the, yeah. just to go the extra mile. Uh, so you can go and check them out, and all the intricate details are on the website. All you've got to do is click through them. I didn't mention the prices of those, so Daryl mentioned the 21% off, which is now for the Apex, which is 2739 The top end of the Pulsar Trail is 4879 and the standard definition version is 3589 Pretty damn good. And just in case you missed the website it's all the w's scottcountry.co.uk forward slash pace brothers and uh I'll, that's just for the stuff that we talked about yeah here. Just, they've got but, loads but of you other can things you can also. click through other things on the website as well uh, that's just an easy url so that you can get stuff quickly from us and uh i'd get get clicking because judging by how quick things come in and go out, and of go Scott out Country, yeah. if it's something that tickles your fancy then i'd probably get the order in sharp 
Yeah, exactly. And we are going to double check, but their delivery is they normally post pretty close to Christmas as well. Uh, they're normally really good like that. We're, we'll find it in a minute. But yeah, if you go check that out, uh, we encourage you to. And like all of the, the things we mentioned in the show, uh, when we've got people supporting the show, we would appreciate it if you help us by, by helping them. By helping them. Uh, because they support us, and uh, if you good people would go and you know go and check out their stuff and see what you like, then everyone wins. Absolutely. So the last thing to mention before we get into the kit is the competition that's running from a week ago, which we are going to announce on the first show when we come back. So it's actually it's going to run over quite a long period of time. It's going to run over a, a couple of weeks because we'll mention this week of the 6th when the podcast goes out but we gave everybody the opportunity to win a brand new latest edition Hornady reloading manual with all the new Creedmoor loads with all the latest powders it's in it it is the reloading manual that I use myself and all we wanted you to do was go and leave us a review so whatever the podcast platform is that you use go and leave us a review on there preferably five star if you can manage that but We'll take criticism too. And I think I said on last week's podcast, which I introed without Daryl, um, because he was doing the big journey home that he was telling <laughs> you about, uh, was I don't think you can leave a review on Spotify. No, you can't. So if you're a Spotify user, maybe just see if you can log on to another one of your podcast apps and get leave us a review through there if you're a Spotify user, please. It helps us a lot because it helps us get ranked uh, in, a, in better positions while people are searching for certain um, words and things that interest them on the podcast apps yeah really cool i was going to say another um, part of my journey which was actually quite cool and probably the, the the nicest part of the whole journey is i got to sit next to uh, a lovely lady and we were with each other for like three hours or four hours or something and we get chatting and we got onto the topic well i we basically found out she was a vegan we we're talking about our instagram pages and um, she saw our page and we started talking about hunting and talked about the podcast and I, oh, because we actually had like three flights together, I said, oh, well, you know, check out our podcast, listen to the one that shows. Um, we were talking about, you know, different things we believe in and she actually listened to one of the salmon farm, the salmon farming one uh, and when we landed, uh, we were talking for a bit longer and she said, you know what? There's actually a huge amount of things that I believe in that you also believe in, but I, you know, like it's well. Her her objection from what you were saying was mainly before, dairy, mainly dairy, and yeah. the animal welfare aspect of it. That yes. was that was why she'd made that life choice. Wasn't yeah, it? it was. Yeah, and she appreciated the fact that w- a lot of the decisions we make is actually f- because of a, a respect of animal welfare and making sure we understand and complement wild populations. She, like, when I explained to her about, you know, going, you know, hunting a deer and, you know, harvesting the meat, she actually said that she appreciated that more than anything else because one of her other big problems was people not appreciating where the food actually came from. Just seeing it in a packet. Just seeing it in a packet. So, well, I mean, that's understandable, but it just shows you that if you actually have time to speak to people, especially in situations where you're kind of, you know, almost forced it, yeah. into it, uh, that, you know, people aren't that different, really. And it also, rem- when you were telling me uh, that story, which I thought was awesome, it reminded me of, of something which is, imp- I, I think we forget when we're having these conversations as hunters, is we're not trying to get everyone else to hunt. No. It's not about that. It is about helping people understand the reasons why we do it and potentially the benefits of it as well. It's not about converting people. That's not what it's about. It's just a greater understanding between us and everyone else. And for us to understand more what, why other people exactly, take yeah. certain views like you did. Yeah. Um, so I think that's it. Now we can get into Kit. Yes, we can. The The juicy part of the year. You, uh, we, we put this out a little bit later than we'd like to, but on most websites, including our own, which we're going to talk about some of the products, you, you when this goes out, you probably have a day. Yeah, that's probably about probably it. Probably about it, but... Still, if not, a lot of people, sometimes they wait until just after Christmas. And I've been doing some kind of last minute uh, And you'll be amazed, actually, how many people come to our shop. Uh, we had, or last year, we had orders on Christmas Day. <laughs> so that was. Either, I don't think those people expected it to get there in time, though. <laughs> but that either that was someone that went, oh, I didn't get the present I want, and I'll just order it myself. <laughs> uh, 
or maybe. maybe it was a last minute thing. But yeah, it, 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 these these obviously these are things that will just take you out throughout the year. The great ideas just for not necessarily Christmas, but throughout the year. Uh, but you do have probably a day to order them if you really need to. There was actually one other thing which I forgot to mention when we were doing the Scott Country wrap up, was that their customer service is freaking awesome it's probably one of the best in the industry so if you have any confusion because it confuses me with all because the technology moves so fast when i'm reading about the different types of equipment and you're trying to make a choice between one or the other don't hesitate to pick up the phone and speak to them because they're they've got a team there and, and they really really know their and, stuff and tell them we sent you yeah and you'll be looked after twice as good <laughs> okay so with that out the way i will i'll start with the first thing so the first thing on my list uh, and I've actually been asked about it on Instagram with a couple of pictures that have been up in the last year, was what jacket are you wearing? So for the answer in those in those pictures that it was relevant to, was I was wearing one of the new uh, Swazi Tar Ultralights. Which is not out yet. It is not. I had one of the prototypes, which I wore for the first time over a year ago in Nepal. Uh, and I wore it there. We actually left those jackets there. Simon and I left them with the guides. And then I got another one sent out before I went to New Zealand. So I've worn that in New Zealand and I've worn it uh, through some of our um some of our winter now. And I, I love it. I know that they've made some they made some changes between the first one and the second one I got. And that just shows you how seriously they take their development. You know, they they have stuff out in the field for a number of years and they're making a changes and adapting it so that they can deliver the best product to the end user when well, eventually I'm they sure it. I mean uh our listeners probably know better than us because they can go back and they might recently the one that Davey Hughes has been on twice and he was talking about I think the tar one that I've got Uh, it's just the tar just the the tar I think that that went through about five or six years Mm. of development before it was released Mm. and I like that yeah so the the ultralight is a very similar cut to the, the tar that you might be more familiar with uh, but it's made from a completely different material. It's an ultralight waterproof material, and it packs up into to nothing. I think it weighs... I don't have the numbers at my fingertips. I think it's like 430 grams. It's it's basically nothing. Obviously, being a lightweight material, it's not going to be able to take as much abuse. A battering, yeah. But I haven't damaged it yet, and I haven't been... Like I haven't been uh, wrapping it up in cotton wool or, or necessarily being careful with it. I've just been using it because that's how he wants me to use it. Since so. you're on jackets... I was going to mention my jacket, which is the the Swazi, Swaz, no, it's Swazi. Swazi. It's Swazi. Yeah. Uh, Swazi tar, and I've been using that now. This not, is a soft not, touch one. This is a soft touch one. Honestly, one of the best jackets I've ever owned. I use it in so many different situations. This year, we've, you know, from cold to even the warmer summer days. Not, I'm not talking like the height of summer, but I'm talking like autumn. Even then, you can zip it down, and it's small enough. It's not as small as the one that my brother's talking about, but it's still small enough that you can just put it in your backpack, and it's not going to cause too much of a hindrance to you. Um, it's, I, I don't know. It's here's a here's a good uh, here's a good example of what. I mean, all the stuff that we're talking about here, it's not we're not being paid to mention. No, 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 so, no, no. And but here's the the best testament is that. Um, Jackets have been purchased at full price yeah, for yeah. friends and relatives. Yeah, uh, I think that is a test. Because we got we got given the stuff that we that we were wearing to be completely but, honest, but, but we, that's but, because but, but, but we we weren't given it to review no, 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 or no. anything. This was given to us to use because well, we were on projects feedback, yeah. and give feedback to the company. Not and necessarily. because we we knew Davey, yeah. and he was like, you know, we'll hook you up with some kit. But we have cupboards full of kit, cupboards, and this is what we pick. At this moment in time, you know that might change, but at this moment in time, this but, is. The, but that's, Jack, what, that's what I wear every wearing. single yeah. day, which I'm upset right now because my luggage is still not here and that oh, jacket shit. is in it. Oh no! Yeah, uh, but in terms of cost, it's it's about four hundred pounds with postage, uh, and I have to say, okay, that is, I wouldn't. I, that's I would say that's that's exactly where those jackets are in terms. It of It is the a lot of money. Don't get me it's, wrong. It's a lot of money. But you will not be buying another jacket again for years. Yeah, I, and their service is very good. Their service is very good. It, it it is worth the money. It's worth that investment. It's the kind of jacket when you put it on, and it, it's a day like we had yesterday, which was uh, kind of looked like a meteor had hit, and the the, cl- the sky was black. It was and, game over. 
game over and sideways rain, you put that on and you have the confidence that you will go out in the rain and you'll be fine. Hmm. That's the kind of jacket it is. There's actually... Um, and it goes to your knees. It, yeah, which I really which like. Which is really cool. So does the ultralight one. There's a video out, just you said re- quite recently, Daryl, that Davey's on talking about and that you can see in the factory it being made. Yes, you can, yeah. That's on YouTube at the moment. Um, so for me, this is in no particular order because I just, as things came into my mind, so we're going to go from jackets now to camera equipment. Uh, Rode Link. Now, we ro- a Rode Link is a wireless microphone system. We bought the first Rode Link about a year ago, and prior to that, we'd been using Sennheisers. And the Sennheisers were fine, but I mean, I, I've literally had the Sennheisers for about 10 years. They're very expensive, the 500 plus. F- for, for, for the cost of them, they are not good value for money. No, I don't think so. No, and I don't even think the audio quality is that no. much different. So we, we bought the Rode Link actually as a backup, and I used them for the first time in anger in Nepal a year ago, and they were awesome. I was so impressed with them. So we started to only use them, uh, and we've just recently sold the Sennheisers, and we bought another Rode Link. They're 250 30, right? 30 pounds for the transceiver and the microphone cable and everything like that. Yeah. The only thing I would say about them, which just keep this in mind, is I've had a small issue recently which I need to investigate and try and fix. Because it's a digital out, uh, because it speaks digitally rather than an analog, I had it interfering with another mic when I had it turned on. So I, I need to look at that. So it's just something to bear in mind. I don't have the answers to that yet. I'm going to move straight on to, which kind of goes with the jackets, because when you, when you, we've talked about it before, about layering. And like you cannot rely on that jacket for pure warmth. It's just not. It's not, it's not that warm a jacket. It's not going to happen. You, you have to do it with a layering system. And typically, like when I was in Austria, it was minus thirteen, and I wear a t-shirt and incidentally a Swazi fleece, uh, fleece layer on top, micro yeah. fleece, and then I wear the jacket. And that's suitable for minus thirteen while walking. I could actually lose the fleece and just have the t-shirt. Incidentally, I just remember we got an email from someone i apologize if it never got replied to uh, we have been it will have been replied so to I'm, busy i'm up to date yeah uh someone asked me i think oh. it was about how i cope with sweating so much oh it must have been to your personal account then. maybe it so was my personal because uh, i don't remember that email uh it might have even been a message on instagram okay. or facebook you you're, you're a machine uh, when it comes uh, to sweat uh, everyone knows about it when i've been <laughs> in norway lisa uh she jokes about how much i sweat and there is no it's not about me being, I mean, I could be fitter, but I'm working on that currently. But it's, it's seriously, it's not about me being unfit. I just sweat. I'm just that Some kind of person. Just sweat a lot. And there's no way to counteract it other than you have to be smart about the clothes you take up. So I will take a spare t shirt with me. And when you get to the top or you know that you have completed the hardest part of your journey, then you swap t shirts. And that is the only way that you can keep warm. And be comfortable for the rest of the day. There's there's no other way around it that I've figured yet. So that is simple. That keep a spare t-shirt. That because if you're wearing the micro fleece and the t-shirt underneath, only the t-shirt will be the wet bit. Yeah, because the micro fleece wicks. It's yeah. quite amazing. But were you is your acclima layer is that a separate item? Yeah. So I mean, well. I was kind of going on to that of a layer that I've started using. We kind of we, we started using it in Svalbard, and I've continued to use it, particularly the actually the trousers. And the netted ones. The netted trousers. And I saw these when I was in Norway a few years ago. I was like, I want a pair of those. Got some. And they're, the only way to describe it is they look like a string vest or mm. uh, like Raz Nesbitt's kind of string vest. That's what it is. It's just a, uh, a netted fishnet material. It You know, you could maybe cross it over with some... Um, nightlife or, or cross dress <laughs> the weekend. And the weekend if, if you, you want to see it, there's actually a picture of me holding a camera on our Instagram, and I'm wearing the top version of it. Yeah. But in a picture, you can't. The, the the fish net is very very tight, so from a distance you can't even see that there's holes yeah. in it. But there is. But there is. And Joseph took the piss out of me repeatedly for it. I just the weekend passed minus thirteen in snow up to my waist a lot of the time. My trousers got wet because I was just wearing my normal trousers and gaiters. And I, eventually, after a day of walking through snow, you melt the snow on your legs. Yep. And my, my trousers were frozen. My legs were warm. Really? And that's because I was wearing those fishnet tights underneath. Fishnet tights? <laughs> that's, that's a whole other thing. That's though. a whole other thing. That was a different I was list. wearing fish. <laughs> fit, I was wearing <laughs> those thermals. Thermals underneath, not fishnet tights. I don't own a pair of those myself. <laughs> 
Uh, moving on. <laughs> uh, so, uh, moving on, uh, I might as well talk about trousers, since they go underneath the trousers and not underneath the skirt or anything. Uh, Fjall Raven trousers. Which I can also attest to. I'll back up everything Daryl's about to say. I have... We, I think I trousers... When did we get them? We've had them maybe close to a year. A year now. Uh, Trousers have always been a struggle, and we've always we endorsed our Fortis trousers. Still, nothing wrong with them, the light light ones. Uh, but I always felt like there was something missing, and that one of them was a vent, mm-hmm. and the second one was uh, padding on the knees. That reinforced reinforced yeah. padding on the knees, uh, and then there was more on the bum. And we got the Fjall Raven ones, and they kind of ticked all of the boxes. They had the stretchy bits and the stretchy bits, so like bum yeah. and the backs of your legs. Uh, quite a high band. High band. Yeah. Uh, reinforced knees, and they have zips that go from kind of above your knee, then way past your knee. So you can actually vent your whole leg. You do not buy these trousers for warmth. They're not cold, but they will not keep you particularly warm I don't think no but like Daryl said he used them now in minus 10 I used them in New Zealand it was just a couple of degrees under and with the correct layering mm-hmm. they're still absolutely with just perfect. one layer underneath you're fine uh, and the really cool thing about them they're fairly quick dry very yeah yeah I mean they are I can't imagine remember what they cost but I know that they're expensive I, I can't criticize them, to be honest. Like, there was two little bits of feedback I gave them uh, after I came back from New Zealand, and one of them they'd already fixed even before, and that was that I wanted the zips, the vent zips, to open the other, the way, other, round other way around. Because yeah. currently, if you're walking in snow, and well, sorry, not currently, with the ones that we had, they've changed it. Now. Yeah, so it zips from the bottom to the top. To the top, so that means, yeah, like I say, if you're walking... Did you experience this? Yeah, so if you're walking in snow, it will go down your trousers, your trousers yeah. if you start to zip zip it yeah and you up. can't because to yeah. vent it a little bit you have to open it at the bottom but, but they've actually fixed that won't that be already. an issue for anyone else yeah. because that's been fixed but that shows you another company and we know much less about the company because we, you know but with swazi we we know the owner uh, but it just shows you as another example of a company getting continuous feedback and making changes because they'd done it before i'd even mentioned it to them so yeah great trousers uh we oh, mentioned, i was gonna say uh, they've actually got um Kind of not built-in gate. No, they do have. It is built-in they, gate. So yeah. they've got a clip on the front, and then you can tighten and loosen it to put it around boots. They've got like t- two pop button things at the bottom. It actually works. Yeah, and I'll tell you something. Here was another bit of development because I, when I was explaining about my issue with the zip, uh, was that originally when they first designed those a couple of years ago and they had the built-in gaiters, the hook was the other way round, more the way that you would expect it yeah. to be. But somebody got their toenail caught in it while they were putting on the trousers and ripped their toenail oh, off. Oh, that's horrendous. So they got, well, I don't know if they ripped it off, but it hurt them. Um, and so they turned the hook the other way around. So you can't, that can't happen anymore. Huh. But it still hooks your laces just as just as well. I'm actually Googling the trousers because they've got a few different types and I'm trying to find the right one. I'm sure it's like the GX. No, that's the type of material. I'm, 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 I'm going to find it right you now. You can find it while I mention the next thing. So the next thing we've mentioned on the podcast on kit a year ago, which is the Didato boots. And we mentioned them again because we're still using them and we still think everything we thought of them a year ago. Um, I don't know how many pairs of boots that we've bought, not because we've had any issues with them, but because we give them as presents to, and a lot of family members and friends end up buying them as well, just off recommendation or seeing the boots that we're wearing. I mean, there must have been 10 pairs of these boots passed through this household. In our household, there's one, two... Three, four, five. Yeah, there must be over ten, ten pairs yeah, between and, the welly boots and, and, the, and yeah, the, yeah. the the walking boots. Yeah. So there you go. I don't think I need to say much more than that. <laughs> but you can go and have a look. Just Google Didato boots. And, and if if you don't stuff. believe us, go on any forum on the groups on Facebook and say what boots. And I guarantee you, the first few comments will be exactly what we just said. Yep. Very lightweight. Very well made. And uh, they look good too. I mentioned dry sacks on the podcast a year ago because we just bought a whole bunch. And now having used them for a year, some of them have started to give up the ghost. But so what I can tell you is the ones that I've been most impressed by were the ones by Carrymore. They're, you know, generic, not a particularly expensive climbing and outdoors brand. Uh, the dry sacks are a little bit thicker than some of the super lightweight ones. But the lightweight ones that I've got, which were... 
Um, I can't remember. They were a Norwegian brand. I can't remember who made them now. The lightweight orange uh, toys. Yeah, I'm not sure who that is. Actually. Um, they've actually started... Uh, two of them have got little rips in them now. And that's just from using them, folding them up, using them. Yeah. They're probably being a bit rough with them, but I mean that's just how we use our kit. The caramel, caramel ones have been great, but they do weigh a little bit more. Um, are you still looking, Darry? Uh, I'll be honest. I'm struggling to find them because I didn't realize how many different trousers they have. Uh, and... Th- they kind of all look fairly similar. I mean, I'm in the hunting section right now, but they may, might not actually be hunting trousers. I'll mention the next thing while you do the last bit looking. I am a big fan of axes and blades. I always have been. And I bought myself a splitting axe about a year ago from Holt Force. Holt Force? Holt Force? I think that's how you say it. They're Swedish or Norwegian. One of the two is Scandinavian. Hand forged heads with beautiful handles and I think it's cost about 85 quid which you might say well that's a lot of money for axe when I can go to B&Q and buy one for 25 quid but an axe like that is the kind of thing that you have well you should have for the rest of your life you might have to one day put a new handle on it but it's you know it's not a it's not a short-term investment and because I quite like axes I get a lot of pleasure out of using it as well and it's been it's been fantastic so I thought I'd just mention that as a as one of the companies who make fantastic axes because I have been using it in anger to stay warm <laughs> this winter I I honestly can't find the trousers so if you want to know what the trousers are and you genuinely are interested in buying them send us a message or email us because we will know by the time this goes out because yeah. we can, or I can't because my trousers are in my back, uh, which is currently away somewhere else right now. But we will be able to give you exactly because it'll be on on our trousers. The Keb, I think they are. I think they're the Keb trousers. Okay. Yeah, I seem to remember that. But well, yeah, we can always check. So yeah, just email us or message us. I'm sure us all the kit's good, but that's the one bit that, of kit that we have. So. Yeah. Um, you're up. I am up next. Oh, I am going to talk about... Phone cases. Everyone likes a phone case because everyone needs a phone everyone case. needs a phone case. And if you don't have a phone case and you're prone to cracking screens, get a phone case. Beth, have you got a phone case on your phone yet? Yeah, oh, she does. She does now. Yeah. Uh, Life proof. I think I've mentioned Otterbox before, and uh, everything that I still stands about Otterbox. They uh, just sponsored Donny Vincent's new film. They did. And the reason why I change between Otterbox. And LifeProof is one size, a lot, lot smaller LifeProof case compared to the OtterBox. It was like adding an extra inch around your phone, the OtterBox. I mean, the protection was amazing. Secondly, you need cargo pockets. To yeah, carry. You, you need a big pocket. Secondly, the LifeProof is actually fully waterproof. The OtterBox wasn't. Hmm. So the OtterBox was kind of drop-proof and then, I guess, shower-proof. Uh, but this is actually, you could take this underwater. I'm and I have back. Is that sealed? It's sealed. It's is completely it? sealed. And huh. even the the headphone jack, that's the only thing that's actually a little bit of a pain in the ass. It um, the, the headphone jack, is it, it comes with an attachment so that it's got a, a rubber seal. Uh, so you can't just plug headphones in, which is quite annoying. You, you need to use that jack because it, it's not long enough to get in because of the phone case. So could you, in theory, listen in the shower? Yes, in theory, yes. Huh. It'd be if fine. You had I've, take, I've taken it. Um, or you could just have the speaker on. But I've yeah, got a speaker so. in my shower, so I don't need that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the life proof case, I've dropped it, I've abused it. I this is my second case. They're they're about fifty pounds, but if you put fifty pounds, I've never broken a mobile phone, never, and that's because I've had good cases on. And if you take out your phone insurance, which is probably like seven ninety nine a month, you'll pay for the case. Yeah, yeah, three, four times over. So get a good case, you, then you don't need phone insurance. And then, like me, every three years, then you just sell your phone on eBay and then buy a new one. Or four years. I, I I try and extend them for as long as possible. From phones to guns. I have, haven't been using this very long, but I've been very impressed. I Believe it or not, this is the first season that I have been shooting on the foreshore. So I, I've been shooting with uh, my buddy Eden on the foreshore for ducks and geese and I don't know why it's taking me so long to do this type of hunting because it it's fantastic and so much good fun but the one thing I didn't have was really a suitable shotgun for it because I shoot a 20 ball most of the time I have a clapped out old side by side but it can't shoot it's not proof to shoot steel and we need to shoot steel on the foreshore so I got my hands on a Meraki XTR they'd retail about eight nine hundred pounds 
and it is it's fantastic i've happened to have shot really well with it which probably that maybe gives me a slight bias because i'm not that the world's best shotgun shot but with that gun i just seem to be able to hit stuff and i compare that to the gun that eden has from another manufacturer and other ones not i don't really know my semi-autos that well but it it works and it's inertia driven so it's not driven it doesn't have gas ports so it's easy i haven't spent really any time apart from pulling it through cleaning it it's been abused on the foreshore with salt and mud dirt and grit and it just keeps working so i'm probably gonna have to talk about it again in a year's time when i've done two seasons but so far so good and i've been very impressed with it moving on to some more gear that's going to keep you warm now the hats i want to mention I think you can only get in Svalbard. So unless you are, well, buff, unless you want to travel to Svalbard, and if you do want to do that, then go over to Soundgrouse Travel, speak to those guys, they'll get you over there. Uh, or just message us and we can give you the details. Possum hats. Now, you can buy these. They're not the same design, but you can get them from New Zealand. And I tell you what, they are amazing. If you can get and they're so soft. They're so soft, they're so warm. And I think the testament is that I, we've been wearing it since we came back from Svalbard, but all of the guides out there all wear the possum buffs and possum hats. And if they're wearing it in minus 30 for like actual whole seasons, there's a good reason. There's a good reason why. And they'll definitely, they're, they're not the cheapest things on the planet. I think my hat, but I don't know if that's just because I was in Svalbard. Uh, I think it was about forty pounds. I think it, yeah, and the buffs weren't much less. Yeah, but well, well worth, worth having. It. Well worth having. As long as you don't lose it, it's the kind of thing you have for a couple of decades potentially. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Um, trail shoes, not really hunting related, but outdoor related. I bought myself a pair of trail shoes when I was training for to go to New Zealand. So about six months before that, um, so about a year ago. Uh, before that, I just had. Uh, whatever they were a generic pair of running shoes that were really more designed for running on roads and stuff than anything else and i couldn't believe what a difference it made actually having a proper off-road trail shoe and the brand that uh well i tried a whole heap on in in the shop and the ones that i settled on were a pair of solomon's with the like the single um jaw pool for the laces those super thin i don't know what they're called i'm sure they've got a name those super th it's not wire but just the super thin laces uh, on a toggle and it just tucks into the tongue of your shoe um, and they're still going strong and it's one of those purchases whenever I put them on I feel good about it so that must tell you something so that's the reason it's made my list because <laughs> I do use them a lot now actually they're not wholly appropriate but I have been using them in the gym as well just because they're so comfy mm -hmm. oh well keeping on shoes uh, I am just a way to purchase uh, another pair of shoes but uh, they're kind of they're called um uh, or base camp shoes, or uh, they're not trail shoes. They're kind of they're, like, they're not walking shoes either. They're like this hybrid. They're cross they're trainers. Not tra right? They're not trainers either. They're not cross trainers. Yeah, so they're, they're for yeah, they're, they're kind of for walking around camp, but they they can also do a little bit of walking off a trail if you needed to. Uh, I bought these Mammut pair. It's the brand with the big woolly mammoth. About three, nothing else have got a cool logo. About three years ago, and they have been one of the finest pairs of shoes that I have ever bought in terms of comfort, being able to travel around with them. They're super light. They've actually you do a lot of traveling in them. Don't a you? lot of traveling. In the Gore-Tex lined, which um, I thought would have actually been a problem. My feet would be too warm or something, but they weren't. And it does mean when you arrive in places like Austria where there's slush on the side of the road, I don't have wet feet when I'm walking around, uh, you know, when I first start. So, yeah, really good shoes. I'm probably a way to get another pair, not not necessarily the same brand. I'm actually thinking about getting a Solomon pair, but they're identical to the Mamut ones. Mm. Um, reloading. Uh, we often meant give away reloading stuff on this podcast, uh, but something that I've been loading recently, well, last six months I got my hands on these and I've done a bit of hunting with them and I've been very impressed. I use Hornady SSTs a lot anyway, uh, but the 123 grain 6.5 mil Hornady SSTs in my 65 by 55 what a tremendous combination. So I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into my Rodos now and that's probably the rifle and combo that I'm going to be taking out the most if I can. Awesome. Now I've got an item that I've probably mentioned every year as well. There's a few of these, which is gaiters. 
Fortis Gators. Uh, they I think they're about 30 to 40 pounds. They, I mean, they've lasted me year after year after year. And I, I love them, absolutely love them. I was using my um, Swazi uh, Gators in Norway and although Byron's got on really well with them, I didn't get on too well with them, me personally. So I, I've i gone back to my Fortis ones and they they work fine in the snow, they've work, walked fine everywhere else. And the only thing that I would say, there's a few design things that I, I would like changed on them. There's there's a little bit too much Velcro on, mm-hmm. on them. I bet at the time you probably could have got that adjusted because they, they do do adjustments, don't yeah. they? Yeah. But I mean, I got mine a few years ago, so they're not they're not they're not perfect. I'm not saying they are, but I have not had any issues with them, and they're very comfortable. They look very smart, and I was walking up to almost my knees the other day doing some river crossings, and it stopped water running down my boots really? after three years, and I've never done anything to them. Hmm. So that's a pretty good testament to them. How many things you got left on your list? I have one, two. Three. Okay, well, you go, because I've only got two left. Uh, okay. Uh, back to cameras. Camera straps. Uh, if you would like a really good camera strap, comfortable, uh, it's got a cool little t- tab system so that you can put different tabs on different parts of your cameras, or if, you, like us, have multiple cameras, it means you can swap the strap between cameras without having to, you know, the normal camera straps you get with every camera is the one where you've got to put through the loop and thread and through no the one, buckle. Literally no one on this planet knows how to do the thread correctly. <laughs> if you ever undo it, it that's it, it's game over. Uh, they, it kind of looks like a seat belt. That's what it looks like. Well, it's made from like seatbelt seat, material. Seat belt yeah. material. And it's even got this really cool system in the tabs, which if they are getting worn, you'll start to see this red thread, and it means you've got to replace the tabs. And the yeah. tabs are relatively cheap. It's like it's a couple of quid, isn't it? eight quid for eight of them, so mm-hmm. a pound a tab. And, and we've had them now a year, and none of them are worn out. No, none of them have. Uh, the strap itself is relatively expensive. As straps come, I think it's about 60 pounds or 70 pounds. Somehow we didn't pay that for it. Like When we bought yeah, well, we, it, it was, uh, about it was about 35, 40, or, 35 40. or 40. So keep your eye out on Amazon. I think that's where we got it from. Yeah, but it's it's definitely yeah. worth a, a peak, look peak at. Peak design. Yeah, peak design. I just found one that I must have skipped over because one of the things which I can't really give you much comment on because I'm not using them a huge a huge amount and some of them haven't even arrived yet, but I'm very excited about using, is uh, we have been switching over or adding a whole bunch of new lenses to our photography and our video setup. And they're all Zeiss lenses. So we've got their uh, whole their entire range in fact of loxia lenses which is like mini cinema primes we had some big cinema primes which we use in svalbard but they're like daddies for big top end cinema cameras these are mini cinema primes more useful for the kind of filming that we do and for the small mirrorless cameras so you can adjust the aperture you can adjust the focus you can declick them all on the lens it's almost like fully manual and then I had also used um, at the 85mm Milvis on the Canon when I was in New Zealand to take the vast majority of photos I took there. And I absolutely loved that. Um, but it wasn't ours, it was on loan. And um, we've just finally got our own 85mm Milvis, which is fantastic. And a couple of the classic Zeiss lenses in like 20mm, 24mm. Also just got a macro. As well. And we got a 100mm macro, which I used for the first time we, again, we had one on loan a while ago, and we took a whole bunch of pictures of ammunition for a client, and I used our new one, which is actually ours to keep for good, um, just yesterday to take my first pictures for a magazine. I can't wait to take pictures of bees with them. Mm. That'll be really cool. I have uh, one more thing on my list, which incidentally comes from Scott Country, uh, and it is uh, K9. I'm pretty sure I asked Paul how, how you uh, say it, and it's um, he, yeah, it's can I yeah can I backpacks, and I've had one now I think for about six months, and I've taken it in a few different locations, and I really like it. It's actually very comfortable. I've been using it as a backpack for traveling quite a bit. It's a perfect size. My other backpack before was a, a bit too large, and it's 
and this one is um, it's one it, it le- looks less military or classic military I should say uh, it was designed World War Two era so yeah it's got, it's got a kind of vintage look doesn't kind it? kind of a vintage look to it uh, very comfortable it's got great storage space and like I said it's not too big so it's the kind of rucksack that if you were out just for the day like you wanted you pack lunch uh, maybe one camera and a jacket in it. That's the kind of backpack that, that you're going for. The only downside to the, the jacket, which I think the the jacket, sorry, the, the backpack. backpack, which I have suggested to them, and who knows, they might change it because feedback does change these things. It doesn't have like a waterproof cover, hmm. which in Scotland you need. Uh, you can buy them separately. You can, and these backpacks, I think we need to double check. I think they're about £95. Byron can just uh, quickly check now. But me and Byron have actually... Uh, bought uh, waterproof covers for our other backpacks that needed changed and they're about eight pounds for quite a large um, waterproof cover so it's not it's not the end of the world uh and yeah there we go there we go that's About, a big one this is what you've got 99 99 pounds Yes, uh, there are. They have oh, a whole that's range there. of other ones as well. Ninety-four pounds. Oh, that's your picture. <laughs> that's my picture. There we go. So ninety-four <laughs> pounds, and yeah, I would seriously have a look at that backpack if you're considering something. Uh, there's heaps of different. There's heaps of choice on here. I'm just scrolling through it now. I can give you the exact name of the one I've been using. It's the um, Kanai Pro Gear. What's that word? Traditional um, backpack. Yeah. There we go, and it's even got five stars. I'm not surprised. Uh, and you can see uh, it's actually the picture I took with uh, ammunition that was us on the range with the backpack. It was, wasn't it? Hmm, very uh, good. Yeah, so definitely check that out. Um, I just got two things. One's more of kind of a recommendation than anything else is I have just got my tar skin and skull, my chamois skull and the antlers from a fallow deer that I hunted in New Zealand. They've all been sorted and tanned and cleaned. Uh, by big game taxidermy in New Zealand and they're already on their way and the service has been fantastic obviously I haven't seen the quality of the work of mine but I've seen other stuff that they've done uh, Joseph who I, we, I was hunting with recommended them and their work's absolutely exceptional so I no doubt that uh, the skin that they've done for me will be as well but the service has just been fantastic so easy to deal with and the shipping company uh, the I can't remember what the shipping company name's called, but it's a a different company. The guy called Jeff there has been absolutely brilliant. So I'm looking forward to receiving that in early January. So, yeah, it was just a shout-out, really. Big game taxes. I mean, New Zealand, if you're in New Zealand and you need something done, I'd send it over to them. I was going to add one other thing about the backpack, which I think is a cool feature that I should talk about, is that I've, like, this other backpack I've been using for years, and it's a thing that I really like on backpacks, is it's accessibility flaps so when you pack your bag you don't need to pull three four items out to get can to something get the at the bottom this, yeah so there's a there's a zip that goes all the way down the side Didn't and, the, and the whole the the back piece actually as well unzipped and you can actually sit on it as well so you can actually ah, sit yeah. it on a little seat so this side panel here it allows you in it allows you in yeah that's very good mm-hmm. That is very useful yeah. nothing more annoying than having to take everything out to yes, get to the thing so you, the you don't actually have to do that with this one and the very last thing from me, uh, which is actually more of a question for all of you good folks, is because I haven't been shoot- had the need to shoot steel cartridges for very long, uh, I've only just started to buy a few boxes. Um, I had some in the cupboard, some uh, Ely VIPs. That's what I've been using for geese and for ducks. So I'm completely open to recommendations on steel cartridges. So if you'd like to tell me what you have found works well, and importantly is good value for money because we all know steel's bloody expensive, uh, then I'd very much like to hear from you. Yeah. And that's my last thing. That's it. I had some podcast recommendations, but it's my last piece of kit. Okay. Podcast recommendations on my Um, I think probably at least one of these is going to be the same one I mentioned uh, last year, but I just picked three, uh, two of which I think will be new. Uh, BBC Farming Today. Uh, Most people in the UK will know of BBC Farming Today, although probably don't listen to it because it's on like 5.30 in the morning. (laughs) And most of the time I'm not up that early either, but they do a podcast. So they're very short programs, very, very topical about what's going on, much more relevant to what's happening in UK and Europe, uh, but probably interesting for anyone around the world. And they're about 20 minutes to consume. So you can can listen to the whole week within, you know, a couple of hours. It's a really good BBC quality podcast. Um, program very well produced, very well researched, and they they have the budget to travel around the place to go and see people, yeah, which is do. great, and visit factories and do you know, live broadcasts from there. So 
it's it's one that really does keep you up to date with what's going on. Uh, and it's not it's, although it's farming today, it's not all just agriculture. They do touch on so they, they had something on grass moors recently, in the last few weeks. Um, the Mountain and Prairie podcast, which I think is out of Montana. All of the shows they do on there, you might not find 100% down the, the line of, of interest for people who listen to this podcast. Uh, it can be a bit agricultural heavy and, and go into a lot of detail, but just look at the titles and, and pick things which are all in your kind of interest sphere uh, because it is fascinating. Charles Post, who's been on this podcast before The Ecologist, was on the Mountain and Prairie podcast. That would be a good place to start to intro you to the podcast and then go and cherry pick the guests and topics. Some f- fantastic information there about everything from the way that um, agriculture is changing and being more sympathetic to the land, to the to the nature of, of soil and what we need to be putting back. It's uh, it's a podcast I didn't think I was going to, to enjoy, but it's it actually taught me a lot. So a Mountain and Prairie podcast. And the last one, which I know we've definitely mentioned in the last year, is The Hunting Collective. Ben O'Brien, who's teamed up with the guys at Meat Eater, um, but he still has his own podcast kind of underneath their umbrella called The Hunting Collective, is excellent. And he's just been on the Joe Rogan podcast. I was going to say, and Joe Rogan. That's yes. a good podcast. You can't go too wrong with that one either. No. Nope. Uh, and that is everything... That's everything that I've got to say for 2018. That's your list done. Yeah, it's been an amazing year. I can't believe next year is going to be our fourth year of running this podcast. That is nuts. So thank you for everyone that that listens. We truly, truly appreciate everyone that that listens to the show, that emails, messages us, um, supports our stuff. In in all the ways. By listening, you're supporting leaving a review a lot of you go and visit the shop and buy stuff through the shop that makes a massive difference to us because it helps support all the work that we're doing as well going into next year we have uh big plans ambitious plans hopefully we're our plan is to basically set up a more permanent studio in the in the office so we can have more guests kind of come in and sit around a table for longer periods of time and, and hopefully, hopefully we're going to broadcast it like actually video it so you people on youtube will have something to to do uh coming january as well we will hopefully in line with doing this we want to be able to bring out the podcast more often so hopefully once a week uh and we'll be bringing out uh, kind of like a supporters package mm. as as such um the idea behind it isn't isn't necessarily to say just give us money and we'll do more shows because the shows we always want them to be free so we would never ever want someone to feel like they have to pay for it i think we we have to do that we have to keep the shows free so the shows will always be free but we'll kind of bring out a package where you feel like you're getting something out of it so we're going to make like a unique picture book that you can only get if from our photography archive you can only get through us and that's the idea is that you'll get something unique and then a discount in the shop so you feel like you're getting something more than just more podcasts mm-hmm. uh but we'll all that will come together in january and the only reason why we're doing that is so that we can get more shows and yep. that is that is the simple reason more shows more shows so we can spend more time bringing you better content yeah more time and it means that you know potentially once twice three times a year if we need to we can fly a guest from london to aberdeen and we can record a show in person and you have no idea how much more of a difference that could make and you know if that means that we can spend 50 pounds on a plane ticket to get someone up here and we get a, a good amazing show then then it's worth it. And also tackle, uh, it'll also give us the opportunity to tackle the topical issues faster. Faster, yeah. yeah. And keep on top of keep on top of the news items so that we can become a, an even better resource for people to dip into to understand the current issues. And if there is something outward of that that you would like to contact us about in terms of supporting the show going forward, there, and you got some suggestions, yeah, suggestions, we are open to suggestions. So just email the show, tell us what you're thinking. Love to have a chat with you. Yeah, definitely. And that that's the that's the plan for twenty nineteen with the podcast. We yeah, we hope you've enjoyed the last three years. Three years. The next this will be the hundredth show. I think it is. It will be. Hun- yeah, hundredth yeah, show. So yeah, hopefully next year, once a week and uh that's the that's the plan. I can't honestly can't believe it. No. We've got uh 
a few big projects penciled in, some that are definitely happening into next year. If this year was anything to go by, I think we'll be traveling quite a bit again. But I'm excited. I'm looking forward to what's going to be happening. We're definitely going to be over in the States at some point, so that's going to be something new for us. Very new. Uh, in terms of talking about our shop, in terms of as this podcast comes out, so on the 19th of December, I think we are, yep. uh, 2018, uh, we are now sold out of Modern Huntsman Volume 1, so <laughs> you are too slow. We said they weren't going to hang around. And I it, can't what, believe they're gone. A week? What was that? A about week? a week a after week. the last shipment. They came. are gone. Uh, we still have volume two in stock. We've got we, quite a lot of volume uh, two. So, yeah, you, you, I mean, we say quite a lot. Well, we've got less than half of the stock we started with. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't think it'll all go before Christmas. It won't go all before Christmas. So, you've still got time to order that. So, if you want to jump on the line onto our web shop and grab yourself, you have a day to order. So, t- after this podcast goes out, you have basically... Don't dilly-dally. Don't dilly-dally. We've also got a Christmas bundle on the coffee, which has got good savings. Yeah. And our prints, which have been selling phenomenally well. Thank you to everyone that bought a print. Uh, once we've kind of sold all these prints, because we're only doing a run of 40, 40 for, each. Of, for each picture. And once a run's done, we'll pick more pictures, and then we'll do another run. And we have literally thousands of pictures that we... It took quite a bit to narrow down just 10 images. It, it was really hard. Yeah, it, was it was really was hard. hard. Eventually, the shortlist was 20. And then we had to bin pictures that we actually wanted to print, but we said no, we, we can only print, do print, ten. Yeah, we, so ten. we can always pick them up another time. Th- so there's no there's no shortage, and yeah, I hope everyone that ordered their print enjoys their print, and uh, yeah, it's just something unique, unique. Mm. And like we said, we'll always. I think the um, the ambition is to always just do very limited runs of our pictures. Yeah, so I think so. Uh, and who knows? So we, we we number them on the back and we sign them. And in the future, maybe we'll get one or two big ones framed that we might sell as one-off kind of deals because I got my friend for his 30th a framed picture that I took specifically for him and uh, I got it framed and I have to say it looks absolutely bloody phenomenal I did, I when, believe when it. it gets blown up and then in a frame and you go wow that's actually your picture. When you, can't, you picture. can't touch the other side with your yeah. hand if you're stretched out it was that big. Yeah it cost me a small fortune so <laughs> I, um, I, I hope he enjoyed it for his 30th birthday. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, that's us apart from our, our outro. We're going to go right now into the interview oh, I did with Sarah uh, Yes, we are. But I was going to say just thank you in general to everyone. Um, I want to say thank you to David Baxter because he helped me out with my bees this year. And uh, I appreciate that. And I look forward to more next year with the bees. They're sleeping. I'm looking forward to some they're, of your honey they're, next they're year. Sle- they're, they're sleeping. So um, I, I fingers crossed that we get through winter and all of the bees are, well, probably one or two will die, but uh, most of the bees are, are fine. Uh, but yeah, just generally everyone, all of um, all the people that we've done work with throughout the year, and the people, just everyone, been... which is a lot of different people. We, uh, we we were finishing up and wrapping up the year, and we've worked with sixty individual different people or companies. Exactly, which is crazy. Absolutely, absolutely crazy. Keep those reviews coming in, please. If you are, well, if you want to win the Hornady Reloading yeah, Manual, you you've got to leave us a review. Yeah, keep keep the reviews coming in. They they seriously do help us uh, get up in the rankings. And uh, suggest to a friend, if you are new to this podcast, especially over the Christmas period, uh, introduce another friend to it. And then we'll spread the love. And now you're going to hear from Sarah. <laughs> I have to focus at the start because I, uh, I need a good opening gambit, you see. <laughs> which, is not, with, with which is easy because you've been on the podcast before. So, Sarah, welcome back yeah. to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Thank you very much for having you've, me. Uh, they let you back over the wall in Scotland. <laughs> Just about, occasionally. And you've been given snow. Yes, very nice uh, little surprise, although it did put a couple of photo shoots to, um, yeah, put them for another time. But uh, we made the use of the snow that we have had, so it's nice anyway. We are right at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, Christmas is days away. New Year is not that far away. It's hard to believe that uh, we're at that time of year again. Give me kind of a, a review. Has it been a busy year for you? It's been an incredibly busy year. Um, yeah, very, very busy. Um, I've never known anything quite like it. Probably 
didn't help trying to plan our wedding alongside all of the course. work as well. That feels like ages so, ago. So what? Was it three months ago. Um, so trying to get all of that organised alongside running the business and um, taking on new clients and a lot more work has been. Um, yeah, I'm going to say a lot of ums now. I'm trying to. <laughs> but it's been it's been hectic. It's been very hectic. Really hectic. Give an idea for people what the the life of because it sounds it looks so I- idyllic and we get messages like this all the time. Oh, that's awesome because you're always in cool places because yeah. that's the kind of photography you do. It's the kind of film that we we do is that you're with normally awesome people in amazing locations. Yeah. But give people an idea of what the the life of a freelance photographer <laughs> is like because you you you're never at home. No, it's pretty exhausting if I'm honest, and you just sort of keep running on adrenaline. And it's the times when you actually stop and you have a few days at home that that's when you actually get knackered because you sort of your body then stops. You you can keep going for so long Um, and it's probably nowhere near as extreme as you boys when you're heading off to really, really wild places and really extreme places where it's much more, it's harsher on the body probably for you guys. Um, But doing the field sports stuff in the UK, certainly into the winter this year, it's been pretty full on. So yeah, probably... One, maybe two days out of seven we're at home. The rest we're away. I mean, right now we've been away since last Monday. Um, I dread to think prior to that. We'd only spent, yeah, a couple of days at home, so. So your dog's well-travelled too? She is very well-travelled. Poor little poor little devil ends up having to go in her crate and uh, does a lot of travelling. But she gets to see some cool places with us. Or she goes and stays with my mum and dad who um, look after her. Uh, so, um, which is very handy, to be honest. Have you got a highlight from this past 12 months? Other than getting married? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Photograph it. I'm, I was going to say. Given that highlight. Adam is sitting right beside you, it is good that, <clears throat> that, is yeah. good that, that is what your answer was. Um, outside of getting married, which obviously would be your highlight of the year, um, work-wise, have you had like oh. a, an, an event or trip or, or photography that has been just particularly captured you know when you're doing it all the time i know for <laughs> us like you know, we're filming all the time we take pictures all the time and sometimes it becomes a little routine and then every yeah. now and then you get something that just sparks you again it's like this is why i do it yeah um there's been a lot of different i'm just casting my mind back across the years to the different clients and the different work that I've done but um, in November I was lucky to go out to Texas for a client uh, doing some photography of quail hunting and that was totally different and yeah that was that was a pretty cool commission to get that job and so I think that's probably the highlight although I was so petrified of flying that I was um Oh yeah, I wasn't didn't cope so well with that. I need I had hypnotherapy the week before I flew out, and I need to go on all of those um, flying without fear courses because it it it's not an issue, but it could become an issue if I don't sort of grab up get a handle on it. Is that something you've always had, like an, an issue with flying? Uh, it's probably got worse and worse over the years. I don't know why. I'm generally okay if I'm with somebody, but if I fly on my own, then I get really um, I think yeah irrational basically. Did you not fly so, much as a kid? I did, but I was always with parents or friends or somebody that could just keep me talking the whole flight. And if you're flying on your own, you know, nearly 11 hour flight mm. to the States, you I'm can't, asleep. You can't, <laughs> you can't really just sort of keep sort of prodding the person next to you and going, do you fancy a chat? Do you want to just keep talking to me whilst this little bit of turbulence is going? So you, so. you should listen to more podcasts. Well, I did. I did listen to the Ed Stafford podcast on the uh, on the flight over to Texas. And that was actually a big help because it, um, yeah, it was a nighttime it wasn't. It was a daytime flight, but there was obviously it gets to that point in the flight where everyone yeah. sort of goes to sleep, and I couldn't and sleep. It's quiet, so, and you're alone. Yeah, so um, and the lights I, are out. I could I could stretch out a bit because there was very few people um, on the flight with next near me, so I could stretch out across three seats and just sort of chill out and listen to that. So that that actually was a big help. I'm not blowing smoke here, but yeah, it did help to listen to Good. a podcast. Probably more to do with Ed than us being on the show. <laughs> <laughs> he's quite an inspirational guy if yeah. he can walk the amazon you can jump on well that plane. was it it was kind of a, it was a bit like that to be honest i was like what am i doing sarah come on just just pull yourself together love oh well that's yeah the, your your i saw the pictures from your trip to texas and the quail hunting looked awesome now the only quail hunting that i've experienced has been in new zealand what was the oh, kind well, of that format? trumps that well and truly doesn't well, it well no because they don't belong there <laughs> 
you know, oh, right, quite a okay. lot actually, but yeah. also they were, they were introduced, and it was the first time I'd ever done it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found it really unique compared to like, coming from the UK and the kind of game bird um, hunting mm-hmm. that we do here. The quail hunting uh, in New Zealand, which I'm guessing, because I'm going to ask you now, is probably mm-hmm. pretty similar to how they do it in the States, was fantastic. It was like a, it felt like a real hunt. Yeah. So uh, how did what was the sort of format of the day when you were quail hunting? Well, they have um, they have a lot of a massive amount of working dogs involved. I don't know whether that was used mu- that was used much for for your quail hunting. We had one dog. So <laughs> they um they had a a um a dog man. And he was brilliant at choosing dogs. They've got these amazing quail rigs. So he's sort of converted, um, some of them are smaller, sort of Polaris with a back on them. And it's got seats, um, like a safari sort of vehicle, seats on the top. And then underneath that would be these crates where these dogs would be. Okay. And they would, um, you'd travel about on the tops of these, um, uh, seated atop this vehicle. And it would be a case of heading out to the really wild parts of the ranch where you know there's hopefully going to be some quail and um, you'd loose the dogs from there and the dogs would go and point out into the quail, uh, into the, the fields. Um, so it was like rough, scrubby stuff. It was all rough, ground. scrubby stuff, but a lot of it was very much done on a um, conservation and um, they would plant a lot of different plants and stuff and lots of different habitation for them. So it would be... They would, so they're doing a lot of input and work yeah, to create um, the habitat. And they were very much looking at that and sort of looking at through all the different grasses that would be there and going, hang on a minute, we didn't plant that. That shouldn't be here. That's not native. Oh, that's really? not that's not good for the rest of the, the ecosystem here, all that. And they'd hmm. be like, right, we're going to have to have a little look at how we can sort of maintain that and keep an eye on that particular that particular type of grass and things so which was must have been interesting. Where, yeah it was it was obviously a little bit over my head because i don't really know how the texans sort of <laughs> how well, it totally works there. Yeah. You, yeah and it almost reminded me when we came into the bit of ground it was almost quite african okay. in the scrub really sort of yeah sort of brush sagebrush and you walk through um all the grasses and the smells of everything that you you that you you walk through was just fantastic it was really fragrant which i wasn't expecting it because you come to the uk in the the winter and you walk through grasses and everything's a little bit dead and a little bit so um it was it was fascinating for that and um then you get to a point where you're walking through the ground and um the uh, the dogs all of a sudden just, they'll just point and yeah. they stand stock still. I mean, it was almost comical because I've never seen dogs stand still. It was the only thing that would frozen move. Frozen in time. Frozen completely. It'd just be the eyes would be moving side mm. to side, like waiting for the boss or somebody to come in and just sort of thing. So they would um, they would point and then at that point they'd send in a cocker spaniel and that would then flush out the bird. Poor pointers. So um, so the pointers would just be that they would just... I don't know whether it works differently elsewhere, but from what I saw, the, the cockers came in, as mad cocker spaniels do, and um, push out the birds there, and then they're going... And the guns... And are, going at this to, point, the guns are somewhere close yeah. to where the pointers are pointing. Yeah, so... And so how many, how many um, dogs were working at a time? Uh, two, three... I think three pointers... In at various spots, so there'd obviously be a couple of dogs that would go on then, and they would spot, they would point at another spot. So you'd always be uh, okay. sort of being able to keep on ahead and looking at further. So yeah, be able to shoot a couple of quail, and um, depending on who which gun it was closest to, because there's only a couple of guns, it was just a family thing. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, and then you'd be watching, you'd be going, oh hang on, another another dog's pointing, and it was really yeah, very different to to what. I, I, I don't know what what it's like elsewhere in in the states. Whether that's how they work it, I really I've never seen it any other way. So, yeah, it was a very different experience and pretty cool to photograph. But we were expecting it to be blue skies and that kind of crisp, cool, like our autumns that we get, and where it's the lovely, crisp, frosty mornings and stuff. No, nope, none of that. It was just leaden, flat skies. Yeah. Because they'd, I think they'd had the tail end of a hurricane come through, and it was just that tail end of, of cloud cover that kept it all quite flat. It was quite cold, a lot colder than I expected. I didn't really bring quite enough warm clothing. <laughs> but, but you got some good shots. <laughs> so I got some good shots, so uh, yeah, that made it all worthwhile. So. Uh, my question... Uh on a shoot like that, because I've not done a lot of photography of that style of shooting. I've done a little bit this year of um, walked up grouse, which is kind of kind of similar, yeah, um, with pointers. And if you've never done it for the fir- if you've never done it before, 
kind of knowing where, especially if you've got more than one one dog working yeah. and you've got multiple people around you, sort of knowing where to point the camera and how to set up your camera for something like that is, c- could be and can be a bit daunting. I know I got it completely wrong the first yeah. time I did it. How do you set your camera up to be able to do that? Because if you've got, for example, what I was thinking is I always used to... If I'm if I'm to think back how I used to do it in the early days, it was always sort of one shot focus without really using any of the autofocus tracking. But there's stuff right. going on all the time. So yeah. how do you set your camera up to be able to let you to jump between somebody to shooting to suddenly you're trying to track birds flying across the sky? Well, I always use my harness, my double camera harness. So I had two cameras with me at that stage. So I had one camera set up with my 70 to 200 mil lens. Um, so that I could shoot um, the second or third gun away from me and just get a few portrait shots because okay. um, we were focusing on not on just on the sport side of it but also of what, what the kit they were using and what they were wearing in order to get some, some good content there as well. So I had the, the camera set up, that camera set up for that um, and uh, continuous shooting for, for that just to get what action shots and sort of close-ups and details and then on my other camera same camera bodies the Nikon D5 I had my 17 to 35 mil lens and that is pretty wide it's not as wide as my 14 to 24 mil but that's been away for uh, a bit of a service because it's taken a bit of a hammering this past few <laughs> months and um yeah, I had that lens, which you then I set up on a much, uh, had much more in focus. So I'd normally shoot the seventy to two hundred, probably at, uh, I don't know, if, wouldn't shoot it at two point eight, but three point five kind of thing, three point two, three point five, maybe f four if I really needed to, but I try not to, to do that. And then yeah, the seventeen to thirty five, I'm probably shooting at f- uh, five point six between there and f eight, depending on how much I needed to get in focus. But if I wanted to get a panoramic shot of the gun taking a shot and the dog flushing the bird and the bird up in the in the sky because obviously they don't they don't necessarily find massively high so um it's just a case of getting that getting that all encompassing shot i guess mm. and you and you generally stick on the heels or i stick on the heels of of one of the guns it's, it's relatively similar to a walked up days that i've done here in the UK, I guess, with just rough ground with um, uh, just pheasant and partridge, not not grouse. I've not done a walked up grouse day. Um, You'll enjoy that when you So I know. I, love it. I was spo- I was supposed to do um, a couple earlier on this year, but obviously a couple got cancelled. Yeah, um, of course. Due to the, the year of the yeah. yeah, not good for grouse. Um, so yeah, we. Uh, I generally stick on the heels of one of the guns and then if it looks like the bird's going to come back sort of fly over you just duck down and you, you know you've got ears on you don't yeah. mind it shoot over your head and that's fine so um they're always safe so but having just, uh, with the dual cameras that gives you a lot of flexibility though. completely it's not something I've done I would it's ve- yeah I wouldn't be without it now if I if I only had to get one style of imagery it it would be fine just to have one camera or just to get close-ups and details um i'd have my i've got a 35 mil um which shoots down which goes down to 1.4 and i love that that's really good for we use for the 35 mil 1.4 a lot yeah it's one of my main for probably for product stuff and um yeah kit it would be a main lens and because it's lightweight and it's you know you can keep it on you at all times yeah it doesn't stick out on my yeah like a 200 exactly lens. so i really really love that lens and your um your dual harness that i saw you yeah. with at uh, schoon this year what how, how does that work is it actually two harnesses or is it one harness no it's one harness cameras? it's it's just called the double harness and it's got various fixings of velcro and clips and um and straps so that you can adjust it to your body shape and size and it has different lengths and it's just got really handy little quick release clips so that you can yeah just swap it around if you need to have have a change of camera bodies or, or whatever you need really hmm. uh, i think i'm not sure when this podcast is going to go out i have a feeling that we might very well tag it on with a show that we're going to record tomorrow <clears throat> which is going to be our kind of review of kit of the year yeah uh, which is just generally speaking stuff that's either in the car or in my cupboard or in Daryl's cupboard that mm-hmm. we've been using throughout the year, whether that be hunting or camera kit or, or whatever. It's just whatever picks our fancy. It's um, 
I think last year I, I literally just grabbed all the main bags I take places and brought them into the office and then tipped them out on the floor and kind of talked about what I'd be oh, using. Gosh. The kit, camera kit, and things that you use mm-hmm. in your field out taking photographs in the in the great outdoors. Yeah. Can you think of a, a couple, uh, either new bits of kit or things that you couldn't live without? Maybe things that you've changed. Doesn't have to be in the last year, but you know, in the last sort of period of time. Because imagine. What, what there's there will have been an evolution yeah, of equipment very much so uh with the nikon range i'm sorry it's probably a swear word in your household <laughs> we just don't own any that's all <laughs> um the uh i've upgraded to nikon d5 bodies which are their flagship um is that like their bodies? top end yeah yeah, yeah very <laughs> very much an investment mm. and i bought one brand new and a second one the camera shop that I bought from they they very kindly rang me up to tell me they had a second hand one coming and would I like to take it off their hands and I was like they were obviously used to dealing it. with you a lot yeah they <laughs> do and they sort of they kind of roll their eyes when I ring them up sometimes I, I'll, I'll get them to do sensor cleans for me because it's just easier for them to do because I'm I'm terrified I cleaned of... my own sensor this year oh it terrifies me it scared the shit out of me yeah <laughs> I actually, when I, uh, my first attempt, I put marks all over the sensor. And we were like, how, That's why how I've am never I going to fix this? And then we bought a whole bunch of new cleaning stuff and like these single swipe swabs. Okay. And it was amazing. It's right. really not difficult. Most sensors have glass in front of them. So there's yeah. a limit. You can't really damage. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> caveat <sighs> for anybody I, listening. I say touch with I'm them. not <laughs> taking responsibility if you go and try this, but a lot of sensors actually have a piece of glass in front of them. Right. So... Unless you're an idiot and mm. you go and scratch that piece of glass, <laughs> you can't really damage it. You could mark it. You, you say that and Adam's sit there laughing next to us. <laughs> yeah. That so could be your job, darling. We cleaned our sensor and I uh, I did have a couple of days of my heart just stopped beating mm. because there was marks on there that I couldn't get off. But this single swipe swab stuff with the, right. the solution was actually really good. Because they're supposed to be, well, I don't know about your cameras, but they're supposed to be self-cleaning with the sensors. They're supposed to have some kind well, they of... they vibrate, don't they? Yeah. But that's mainly but for dust. Yeah, it doesn't kind of work thing. for... I've got like a couple smudges. of... There's a couple of smudges that haven't... They're quite stubborn at the minute. Mm. And uh, I'm having to do a little bit of airbrushing on a couple of images that they affect. But can't, can't do that in video, so that's why we have to... Oh, that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, that is true. So you're, yeah. you're, you're stuck with it. With a photo, you know, it's pretty easy. You know if you've got a little dust spot that mm. won't come off. You can normally fix that unless it's like over somebody's face. Yeah. Um, but if it's in the corner where they do, they yeah, tend exactly. to leave it on video. You're screwed. Yeah. It's very difficult to fix that. Right. Well, I, I, yeah, this this camera shop um, that I've bought with any time I need advice on things like that, I will always ring them up, and they know by now if I pop in, and because they've been they've been good to me, very good on on some prices and bits and bobs. They've just sort of said any time you need a sense clean, just pop it in. Okay. And normally they charge. 40 quid or something like yeah. that to do it so how often are you so, getting that done not often enough <laughs> well, like <laughs> so, twice a year or something like that. uh more than that probably um three or four times a year wow. i would say but you're taking a lot of photos there's a lot of imagery In hard and environments. it's yeah Land it's swaps. really really dusty really muddy and oft yeah a lot of water uh that's the one thing i wish was that they were slightly more they're weather sealed the cameras but they're still not totally weather resistant where do you end up with so. issues in the interface between the lens and the camera uh it's generally a fogging up issue um so of when you mirror yeah it's it's the mirror and then also on the viewfinder there's it's getting in somehow it's always done it on every whether i don't know whether it's a nikon failing or whether you get that with the canons i've never had it in the viewfinder i've had the mirror fogging up yeah of course on the new mirrorless you don't have that issue. Yeah. That's and I another, can't say I've ever had... That's another story I don't to think at. I've ever had it on any of the film cameras, which are all mirrorless. Yeah. So, yeah. no, the viewfinder's been an issue. And um, generally, if you're doing shoot days, the worst bit is if you're doing, you know, four drives, you get in and out of the car between drives, and the worst bit is everyone's got the heater on. Yep. And then... Oh. <laughs> And it all steams up and then you get back out of the car to go to the next drive and you have a little panic. Oh, my God, it's fogged up. Please, please <laughs> demist quickly. So I, I, we generally, uh, Adam and I, will, when we're covering a shoot day, we insist on taking our own vehicle and the so cameras go back in the boot where it's as almost as level equal temperature, temperature and, and consistency to the outside world. And then that generally fixes things. But it's when you come back in for um, 11 days or lunch that's mm. indoors and... Oh, I sometimes need a the third. Fire's on. <laughs> yeah, I'll need a third camera just to get those interior shots so that I don't 
mess it up, basically. I was given a solution to that the other day, and I haven't been brave enough. I haven't had the, haven't had the balls to try it yet. Ooh. Because I was on a big film project a couple of weeks ago with like half a dozen just awesome camera guys who had... Like, they they had must have had about 120 years between them of experience. It was Gosh. crazy. As so I learned, I was just stealing information from them left, right, and centre yeah. for the whole week I was with them. <laughs> so and I'm I, not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely wasn't. I just, I just I felt like an amateur again uh, with with my little camera, and these guys were using big broadcast cameras and it. And we I got in a car. It's a similar sort of scenario. The one mm. one day and it was super hot inside the car, and all my stuff fogged up. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to film in the car because it was I was doing a behind the scenes yeah. thing I was trying so to film in the car over the shoulder yeah, yeah, that of kind someone of driving yeah. and then somebody talking like beside me in the seat there yeah and I'm uh, fortunately it didn't matter because it was behind the scenes so the fact I was cleaning the glass kind of added to the yeah. atmosphere of it but the the one camera guy there Soren um, he said that if you use men's shaving foam and you put right. that on your glass on your lens okay and then you wipe it off it won't well, uh, as a precursor to the day kind yep. of thing he said, try wow. it on your mirror in your bathroom. So go and put it on a tissue and wipe it on and then, you know, you know polish it off. Yeah. Not too hard, but like yeah, so you can't see the streaks, off, yeah. buff it off. And then go for a shower and you'll see that that Good square God. won't ha- won't be steamed up. Oh, I like that. No, I should test it on the mirror. I will do that. <laughs> uh, not that I actually don't think I've got any shaving foam in the house. <laughs> I'm because gonna I ask, don't shave very often. I'm going to ask Adam, Is it what's that stuff that we bought? Was it Scope? Dope. Scope dope, which is for obviously for scopes, but that was to stop things fogging up. I had some actually as well, but I've never actually tried it on my. I've, I've got a little tub of it somewhere, and I've yeah. never been brave enough to try it on the on the camera lenses. So I wonder if it's got the similar properties to it. Who knows? Could but do. I'd never thought about shaving foam, and I. would who would? How maybe, did you? How does that the, even? So, I suppose if you if you've accidentally got some on the mirror one day, maybe. and then. But then what happens if one? Like most of them are like minty, or you know they've got other stuff in them. You know, corrosive all of a properties you, yeah, exactly. on your. All of a sudden you take off all that that beautiful um, coating that they put on the end. So I don't know if I've got the balls for it. But anyway, try. anybody else who's listening is welcome to try and uh, write yeah. in and tell Just me. Just let works us know. Yeah. Well, I don't use filters anymore because again, because you get the fogging up between filters and on it the was, front of your lens. Yep. Yeah. It's just easier not to... I know you say, oh, everyone must have a UV filter on there and must be protecting your lens. But mm. for me, it's just... I'd rather actually just send it back to Nikon and get them to... to it's funny you should bring that up because um, we... So we use an ND filter a lot, but that's for filming. That's for yeah. purposes of controlling the light. But for photography, I don't... We I used to, a couple mm. of years ago, always have a, a UV filter on. Yeah. And then we stopped using it in like the last two years, maybe yeah, you know, two and a bit years, because I, I, this is my my little brain sort of ticking over. I was thinking, I've bought this very expensive piece of glass. Yeah. Now I'm going to stick a thirty five pound filter on the front of it. Why would you do that? <laughs> you know, you're you're now looking through something which is yes. not perfect. Yeah. And you know, if you're if you're careful, if it's raining, put a hood on so that you don't end up with you don't have to clean it all the time, mm-hmm. and just be careful if there's grit on there. Don't go wiping and score your thing and you know, so far, I don't think there's ever been something that's caused me an issue because I yeah. haven't had a filter on. I've got my my uh, my um thirty five mm lens, the one that I use all the time. Um, I've got a little scratch on that, but it's never impacted. You can't see it. You can't see it because I'm generally I'm shooting at sort of f two kind of thing yeah. with it, and you don't see, you just no, don't you notice anything like that. So mashed into the beautiful milky <laughs> yeah, exactly. Blur. So it maybe it adds to the effect. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking to the guys at Zeiss um, a couple of weeks ago uh, about some of their like super top end glass, mm. and if you re- if you read the, sh- the the spec, it even says it on on the web page. But the guys were telling me this they recommend not to use filters because the glass is so good yeah. that if to use a filter, it's like, why did you it buy that lens? It detracts that? from it Yeah, completely. it detracts from the lens. Yeah. No, they don't re- recommend that on the, uh, their lower ranges because mm. I guess if you're using the Zeiss filters, they're also, you know, it's, it's not like the 30 quid filters that yeah. I was buying. They're actually pretty de- pretty decent glass as well. But they do not make <laughs> filters that are good enough to go with their super wow. top-end glass. Good don't use it. Because well, it probably costs more than it's worth. Oh, yeah, they were about £12,000 a lens. So. <laughs> oh, cheap as... <laughs> yeah. We actually got sent one of those when we did the trip to Svalbard. Nice. I had one of the, the 24 to 100. They called it a super lightweight zoom, but it wasn't light. It weighed, a, weighed more than 24 to 100. That's yeah. an unusual sort of... Yeah, 24. I'm sure it was 24 to 100. It wasn't 105, which is normally 24 to 105. Yeah. But 
Uh, and it wasn't lightweight. It was and very what did heavy. that go down to? What was? Um, I think it was F two. F two. Nice. C- constant throughout. Yeah. And that was about eight and a half thousand pounds worth. Good God. Land. Yeah. It was a good. It's a good crossover, I guess, because it's sort of. It covers your bit of your your seventy to two hundred that you would sort of just if you just need that little bit more than you if you've got a twenty four to seventy or something mm. just need that little bit more. Well, we for filming, uh, it's not ideal for. Uh, we barely ever use it to take photos. It's, uh, I used to, but not anymore. The twenty four to one hundred five Canon L series, which only goes down to f four, for filming is just perfect. Oh, it's really? so so versatile. Okay. Be- because at two point eight and. 1.8 and 1.4 it's so shallow yeah that you can do it for setup stuff mm-hmm. or early in the morning when you just need the light but for the vast majority of filming if you try and film in that all the time it's just like nothing's in focus yeah, yeah there's always just this little slither of uh, of focal uh you know focal plane that you can see so f4 gives Especially you a load of depth if you're on the go as well if you're on the go yeah and if you're walking with someone and trying to you film them as you go exactly. that you kind can't of thing. do yeah. much more than than f4 and it's on a full frame sensor yeah um it still looks it still looks great but lenses are one of those things that a lot of people ask us about actually and i think we, mm. we brought it up on the last podcast we did i think, I think you said did. one of the your one lens you couldn't live without was the 70 to 200 yeah and you've already mentioned your your 35 yeah. on the show and i'd say even for us the 35 Sigma that we use and the 7200 Canon because we're shooting mm-hmm. on Canons for pictures. If I had to pick two that are in my bag at the moment, it would be those two. We do have a whole bunch of new Zeiss glass, which is still sitting in its boxes that I haven't even taken Ooh, out yet. New toys to play with. So maybe that'll change. Yeah. Um, although we have been shooting the last six months with a 50mm Prime, a Canon 50mm Prime, a lot. Okay, yeah. And Nifty I really 50, like it. Yeah. 1.4? Uh, 1.4. 1. 1. Yeah. No, 1.2. 1.2. Yeah, it's the Ooh. L series 1.2. Okay. To be fair, I don't think I've ever taken a picture in 1.2. No. Apart from testing it, because I, I actually don't think it's that good at 1.2. That 2. sharp, yeah. And I think 1.8 is really about as far as you mm. want to That's use That's why I like my, I stick at F2 for the um, uh, 35mm 1.4 bit, so. The Sigma Art that we shoot on in yep. 1.4 is perfect. Yeah. It's crazy good for the money. Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, so we got distracted and uh, half the people have stopped listening now because we've been talking about, about so kit. technical about lenses so <laughs> but geeking out so you, you said that you have upgraded your camera bodies but mm. another two bits of kit that you recommend for people to give people an idea of what you're, you're using What's the what did you say the brand of your strap was? Black Rapid that's your dual yeah your that's dual the harness. harness I did actually go from using that to a different brand and it was a leather one. I'm trying to think whether you'd have seen it at a Scottish Game Fair. I yeah, don't you did think... have a leather strap. Yeah, that was... I had... Um, it's a little bit hipster. <laughs> and it's not as practical <clears throat> but it as cool. my previous one. Because the supposed quick release uh, sections for taking it off the harness are so long-winded and faffy compared to the Black Rapid. And it's actually because it's the leather, it's a lot heavier. And it's. I know I should should maybe give it a little bit longer and let it mould to the shape of my body in that as I'm wearing it. But it's just nowhere near as light or as versatile as the Black Rapid one. Uh, the one that I had, the leather one, is called. It's by Holdfast, and it's uh, from imported from America to. There's a stockist in the UK, and it looks great. And if I was just doing weddings and stuff, and if I had lightweight bodies. On it. Like a Sony or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, then it probably wouldn't be a problem, but lugging around the, the two D5s, which yeah, are pretty, pretty hefty. hefty. Yeah, mm. there's a lot of weight involved for that. So. We use, um, it's not a dual, but uh, just a single camera strap that's adjustable and got the quick release of the Peak design. Oh, okay, not seen that one. And they, uh, they release just what they've got these little round discs yep. that are attached to your camera permanently. Yep. Well, not permanently. Yes. You, you leave yeah. them on there all the time. Screwed and into the tripod um, um Yeah, mount. you can put them into the... I'm just actually looking to see if the... I did have the camera. Oh, here it is. I'm taking it off the desk. So, is yeah, they've similar? got these little round discs that are oh, just okay. attached with tassels. And then oh. that round disc fits in a slot. Oh, with, that's... um. Oh, it's different. Yeah, oh, I did have... Yeah, I had a little wrist strap for them. Okay. But it wasn't... 
enough it'd be fine for that for the for the 5d your mm. body but for the d5 it was yeah, too it, it was too enough. heavy well, it's a, a full strap for that we've got uh, right, that goes okay. around the shoulder yeah but that's the release mechanism for it and it means that if you're you know and if you do need to take it off yeah it's just it takes two seconds yeah the, um, I've I've started to use my double harness now. If I if I say if I'm hunting or um, with a pack of hounds hunting, and I just want to go from having both cameras with me. Say if I've got to jump on a quad bike and I only want the one camera body mm. with the seventy to two hundred on, I'll have the harness, get rid of the other camera, and then I'll clip the second quick release of the other side onto. So ones of you're holding the camera and the the lens. You've got one clipped onto the lens, obviously onto the tripod mount of the lens. Onto the foot of the lens. Um, yeah. So yeah. and then onto the um, yeah the tripod screwing of the of the camera. So they're both together and it kind of it hangs, it swings uh, okay. underneath. Yeah. But it's actually really quite handy because you can you've got you both your hands free then, and if you're on a quad bike, it's really handy because it's it can jostle about an awful lot and you can sh- shorten it then, mm. so that it really just sort of sit in your middle. And and then you yeah you're well away. Funny enough, my brother he often shoots with a, a mount on the bottom on the tripod mount and connects the strap on the normal one on the side and then one on the bottom. Is that as an added safety thing? So no, if just, one just because fails, it sits or... different. Okay. No, he yeah. doesn't use the the other side one. He only uses one side one where a normal strap would go, and then he has an extra plate that goes on here. And it just right, kind yeah. of I don't know. I, I don't wear it like that, but he does, and he likes it. I think it's whatever suits whatever suits your 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 body your, yeah, yourself you or yourself. Yeah, you shoot. I tried once shooting with my big zoom lens on the other side, so on my left side where it's normally on the right. I could not get my head around that at all because I was so it's used like writing to writing left-handed. Completely, yeah. <laughs> I was used to just being able to sort of sort of sort of bit like a draw when you're um, in that in the westerns, you know, when they sort yeah. of uh, draw a quick pistol. Draw. Quick, it was it was it's quick draw with the seventy to two hundred in the right hand, but trying to do it with the left hand, I don't know whether I'm just not as strong. With that, yeah, just didn't work at all. Have you got uh, any photographers on social that you kind of look to for inspiration? I know I, if you were to ask me right now, I can't think of any off the top of my <laughs> head apart from Chris Douglas, who we've been speaking to quite a lot. He takes some freaking awesome uh, cowboy type shots over yeah. in Montana. He lives in he lives in Montana, and he used to ride rodeo, and he's he's an awesome photographer. He does. Uh, he's the creative director for Filson now, and oh, he wow. is just. Yeah. yeah he, he's awesome. The Filson stuff is beautiful. He takes a lot of that stuff. Oh, it's just yeah. It's crazy good. Yeah. Um, but is there it's anyone awesome. that you could think off the top of your head that you could direct people to to go and have a have a y- look at? Yeah, I would say uh, there's a lady on Instagram who goes by the Noisy Plume. Oh yes. And uh, she is Gillian. I want to say Lick. I can't pronounce her I can't pronounce sur- surname, surname. Either, but she's in but she's, Modern Huntsman <laughs> yes she yeah. is yeah uh, she's I've got a slight girl crush on her she's uh, an awesome photographer jewellery designer hunter and she lives in Idaho and she's just seems to live I, I don't know whether her Instagram life is, is, is the same to her real life but it looks a beautiful existence What's out, in, like? out yeah. in the hills of Idaho um, she's hunting she's got these she rides western she's she's an Orvis ambassador and she always looks incredibly incredible how she's dressed even as it's sort of some of the really scruffiest of clothes but then as a photographer her images that she produces um which have been in modern huntsman i think in both issues now is it uh, yeah, Possibly. I think both issues, yeah um she's yeah she just pre- produces beautiful work so it's 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 nice just sort of outdoor photography that is based around a lot of hunting so and i think she does quite a few self-portraits where if she's even if she's riding horses, I have a feeling I might have got this totally wrong, but I seem to remember something on her website saying that she'll set up a lot of the shots out in the fields and then sort of yeah set them up on a tripod or something really? and then get right. I'm fairly sure there's some of them. That's quite impressive. So she she sort of put posts of if you see a photograph of me, I will have taken it. And there's some of them I'm looking going, well, how has she got that? And but the sort of the the feel it's so consistent with her the rest of her imagery that I can't imagine that somebody else did it. Yeah. So um I don't yeah, know. that's a good maybe you should, should get her on the podcast. Well hopefully, that'd be, hopefully that'd be when awesome. we go over there. Oh, we'll yeah. uh, we'll do that. I, I much prefer doing. We're doing more and more podcasts in person because mm-hmm. I think you end up with a way better conversation. It's it's nice to be able to look over the table at somebody yeah. and have a chat rather than over the, over the magic of internet. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then you get a better quality as well, unless somebody can record at their end. So 
we're trying not to do recorded uh, it's, you, you can't avoid it to some extent because you know, people there's interesting people all around the world and some of them I know that it'll be a very long time before we get a chance to see them in person yeah um, but I know that we're going to the States at some point pretty soon so oh yes please Montana, try and actually <laughs> Well, I don't know. How, how far is Montana to Idaho? I, <laughs> it's my idea. geography of North America is not great. I don't yeah. think it's that far. But We're gonna go it's all relative with the, within the States. If you're in North it? America as opposed to being in the UK, I suppose it's not that far away, is it? Or if the noisy plume, if she is listening, then, you know, she can always get in touch with you guys. Yeah, That'd or nice. come over. Come <laughs> and do some hunting here. Very different to her. Um, I'd like to see her approach to f- photography because the light is so different out there in the various different... Well, everywhere really. You it mean makes you, a big difference. The, even in Texas, this sort of the white balance. Even though it was a cloudy day, the white balance uh, I was picking was so different on the K scale compared to what it would be for a cloudy day here in the UK. Mm. And when I've been to Africa, it's 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 very different. There's there's a lot more clarity of light. It just seems better than our sort of. I don't mean, well, kind of have a, we have a murkiness almost yeah, about the UK. And it helps with Scottish images because it gives them a bit of grit and real sort of. Yeah, and earthiness about them. Yeah, good. Like, like yeah. all the Scots. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. What, must... what What about clothing? Is there anything uh, that you're using now you weren't using before? Because you ha- you're out that side all the time, so yeah. it's always outdoor clothes. It's really. Especially your wardrobe is about as green as mine, probably. Uh, there's a lot of clothing, and I've still never quite found the right coat. Adam will probably have a. F- ha- he has a fit because I have. He sort of says, you've got so many coats. One of them must be right. I was like, well, it's not quite right because it's, it's sort of a bit colder today, but it's, I still need to be lightweight for this and da 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 da, da. So I have I do have a million coats for, for each different scenario. Beth uh, loses her head at me because she's like, why do you have so many jackets? <laughs> but the truth is I probably only wear two or three of them, but I have about 50. <laughs> for the entire but you never know room. when you might need well, them. I, so. I, I did resurrect one that I haven't worn for years recently for foreshore, which has become my foreshore jacket. Is um, that what you were wearing? That's what last I was wearing night? the other night. Yeah, yeah, because it happened to be in my bag, and it's, it's a in digital a digital camo. camo, which I don't really wear camo ever. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of it's appropriate for foreshore, and it's quite thick and heavy, so quite warm. So I wouldn't want to walk a lot in it. So mm-hmm. it's not ideal for stalking. But also, it's salty and muddy and horrible, and I don't want to wear my nice Swazi. Yeah when I'm down on the foreshore, not because it's not capable, but because I want to keep it for nice stuff, not, mm. not rolling around in the mud. Yeah, no, it's it's different. You've got to have a completely different setup. So, you know, when you're when you're standing on peg with a team of guns... You've got to look to, smart. ...to get photos of that. And um, so I'll generally wear... Because I've been doing uh, a lot of photography with Shofal, I'll wear my um, a Shofal Rockingham coat, which is lovely ladies' Well, you need to be coat. you need to be in line with everybody else there that you're <sighs> doing yeah. your photo shoot on. <laughs> but it is, it is very warm. It's a nice coat. And that's, that's fab for that purpose. And then I'll have to have something totally different for 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 deer stalking. And again, like you say, for on, for for wild fowling, I've got something up. I can't remember. We got it from Go Outdoors. A um pretty pretty horrendous fishing <laughs> <laughs> like uh, wetlands camo type thing. Yeah. But actually, it's you so wear it warm. In town. No, it's it's it is incredibly warm, and yeah, it's 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 not the prettiest thing at all. But I don't care as long as I'm warm. On the you need to be warm and, a, and dry. And and as long as I'm sort of camo-y, then uh, yeah. yeah, that that does it for me. So, you got anything lined up for next year that you're just excited to to get your teeth into project-wise? Or some of them you might not be able to tell. Well, I haven't, yeah, there's a few that are still in the pipeline, so I wouldn't like to, to mention them wouldn't like to mention them just yet, but. There's probably a, a lot more of the same of what we have been doing, really. Yeah. Uh, it's, a lot of product, really, more product stuff for different companies. A lot companies more product, and yeah, and hopefully sort of, you know, situational, so it's out in the field and actually being used as opposed to, to staging just, it, so, yeah, okay. which is which is way more fun. And so. more easier, I think. I yeah. always find when you're trying to force stuff... Mm. Okay, we're not actually going to be doing any shooting today, but everybody's going to be wearing the kit and we're going to kind of pretend. Yeah. And then you've got to go and make it look natural. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Although it has the advantage of being able to manipulate the situation yeah, and go, if you Hang want. Hang on, do that again. But equally, it kind of... Uh, I'm not sure that that outweighs the detraction from it not being a real event. Yeah. I like the the sort of cut and thrust of capturing yeah. a real event. And it, I, I actually almost prefer that there's the pressure of going... You have only one chance to get this shot. Yeah. Therefore, you better bloody well nail it. You've got to smash it out of the park, and there's yeah. no alternative. So I find it sort of focuses the mind a little bit more if you can if you're gonna do that in a real life scenario, I suppose. Mm. So, 
yeah, we're <sighs> trying to think about next year. I'm still still trying to work my way through this year. I've got a lot of editing to catch up on. So um, that's not yeah. a we were talking about before we started recording. That's not it's not my favorite thing when it comes to pictures. I like you know the odd image which you're really eager to really see excited how about. it's come out once you actually get it on your computer. Mm-hmm. I get excited about that. But my brother does most of the sort of bulk editing of photos. Mm-hmm. And although I kind of do the same thing when I'm v- ed- editing film because every clip on my film timeline is graded and edited for yeah. color, which is basically the same thing you're doing with a picture. But because we're not filming in RAW and most people don't, you don't have anything like the the ability to, to stretch it and change yeah. it and, and morph it into your own style as you do with a, a raw image of a, mm. of a, of a still. Yeah. Um, and I don't mind doing it on film, but it kind of bores me a bit <laughs> for, for stills. It depends on how many images you've got to get through. It's normally thousands. Yeah, These days, there's a lot of images. With, with digital, it's, it's almost made, I think it's made people a bit lazy. It's I, yeah. I I don't know how I would cope if I had to do it on film because you'd have to think about every shot yeah. way more. Especially when I'm shooting, um, if I'm shooting sequences of say horses jumping hedges or mm. someone sh- getting action shots out shooting, it can be you know twelve frames a second kind of thing. So and every, sometimes occasionally similar time I go, oh, it sounds like machine gun fire in the background. <laughs> and you're like, oh, sorry about that. But it's you know it doesn't you don't have to do that very often. But no. uh, that's yeah that's going through sequences of of images is a, a little bit tedious at times but it, it generally the work that i'm doing now is much more what i want to be doing so, so you're enjoying it's, the so process, I'm enjoying the process. so I, I i you know i've taken a hell of a lot of shots this last week as well um it was as well of having a couple of days of downtime and i'm actually what? really excited i know what's wrong with you what is that <laughs> um so i'm actually quite looking forward to getting back in the office properly and although i've done a little bit of editing whilst i've been away it's it's not as good the monitor on my laptop isn't as good as my monitor that i on my docking station uh, plug into back at home so the colors i can never seem to get them quite right on the laptop yeah I agree. Um, they're all right they're fine but i just want to definitely double check everything and really i've got a much punchier screen it makes a huge difference. We color, we we calibrated all of our screens in the office here yeah. for, for video. Well, I was going to ask you actually that. Um, do you use any? Because is it Color Monkey and there's things a couple like of that? bits of software that you can use. Because I'm definitely um, need to get that to calibrate my screens. Yeah, you know, it's such a long time ago. You should do it more regular than we've done it. Well, I've um, never done any. I've never the, done any screen calibration. I suppose that, the thing is that. People view whether it be video or stills on so many different devices mm. now, and everyone's screens are calibrated everyone's completely screens, differently. Exactly. So what we tend to do is, especially with a video, is I'll, I'll make it, I'll upload it, unless it's YouTube or or Vimeo. Actually, is better because the the quality is better. The quality is better. Yeah. And then I'll go and look at it on half a dozen different devices. Yeah. I watch it on my iPad. I take some notes. Watch mm-hmm. it on my phone, which should be pretty much the same because they're That's both Apple. I generally find that my my phone is what is my what I find is as, as my constant, yeah. and that's most consistent that's for me. For yeah, great screens, and yeah. I I would agree. That's if it looks good on an iPhone or a exactly. iPad, I almost don't care what it looks like on other screens because it's because the screens are probably not as good. And you generally know a, a lot of your film people are going to be watching on their iPhones or iPads, yeah. so you kind of it's, yeah, sad, it's, it's kind of sad to say that, yeah. but the um yeah I think that is if I've been working away on the laptop and I'll have to do an edit that's instant to get it straight to a client yeah. i'll email a low-res version to myself so i can look See it up my phone like. and just go yep really happy with how that looks on that and then yeah i'm happy for it to go to the client we so. do the same thing put it in dropbox so that i can look at it because i know i know that the vast majority of clients are probably going to see it come through on their phone mm. and then they're going to sit and they're going to flick through and their yeah. their initial kind of approval of your work is going to be the dropbox flick through mm. on their phone yeah. That's the reality of it. That's very true. Uh, and really the same is. as uh, YouTube links for like first cuts for approval or changes. Mm-hmm. Most people are, are going to watch that on their phone or especially if there's some if it's uh, someone who's on the go that you're working with. It's different if you know that somebody's in an office all the time because then they're going to look at it on yes. your office computer. Yeah. But yeah, the bottom line is I, we a, check it on loads of different devices yeah. to see how it looks. A lot of sporting people, you know, they'll it's sort of similar to us, they'll only have a few days in the office a week yeah. and they'll be out in the field themselves. So you know as a client that you've got to have it, you know, available so they can they can access it straight away anyway, so 
Well, Sarah, it's been awesome to speak to you, all but briefly compared to the last podcast. Because, um, <laughs> quite it is, relieved about that. It's 20, 20, 20, I, I'd happily talk for another hour, but we've got somewhere we've got to be, unfortunately. <laughs> and you guys, uh, you, you're staying not too far away from us. Yep. Um, and tomorrow you're going home. Heading, yep. And you're not, please journey. tell me you're not going anywhere else before Christmas. You don't have any other work on, do you? Yes, yes, we do. We've got a shoot day on uh, Thursday up in Wales and uh, quite a little way into Wales as yeah. well. And then I am photographing at Olympia Horse Show on Sunday Sunday before Christmas, tw- Sunday the 23rd. It never stops. So, yeah, but then I am having some time off between Please Christmas and New Year. Please tell me you've got Christmas Year. Day off, at least. Yeah, well, uh, we had this conversation <laughs> with Adam earlier. He was like, you'll probably want to turn around and do some editing or something like that. And I was like, that's tempting. No, no. Don't, um, don't do it. The thing is actually trying to get to the point where you're at home and not feeling like you're pressured all the time to edit. But it's almost and, impossible. Um, yeah. Because like you for us there is always something else that can mm. be done my aim is to close the office on friday this week yeah. which is a couple of days before christmas but the reality is on friday they will there will be a list of things which are maybe not pressing but they still need done at some point and somebody and something will just something will just pop up as well from something that is relatively that is needed shouldn't it a bit more urgent and you think oh i'll just do this no i'll just do that and then before you know it half the day is gone yeah um, you feel like you've achieved a lot, but you still then you can't switch. I can't switch well, off very easily. For the first time ever, I actually sent an email out to a couple of uh, a couple of clients that I know normally ask for last minute stuff about this time of year because of the mm. shows and stuff coming out. And I said uh, my office closes on Friday, and I'm not going to be in until the sixth of January. So if you need anything, it has to be this week because yeah. I'm, I'm not coming in. Well, you know, money talks. <laughs> yeah, I would depends how much in, you want to pay me for this. Yeah, but I'm just I, I don't know. I just need some time off. I, need some time. I, I want to go and do feeling. some hunting for myself. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Well, I'm desperate to go out with some foxhounds um, over Christmas because I haven't. That's sort of become more of a hobby now because okay. that's my my downtime is yeah. doing it. Even though I go with a camera, because that way I can just sort of yeah, I can just get a few nice shots but for myself. That's pri- not a privilege client. treatment when you've got a camera, don't you? I find that a little bit. I find I can hide behind the camera. Yeah. I'm much more confident going somewhere if I've got the camera in front of me. Yeah, it's basically. like walking around the pub with a pint. <laughs> it's like if you're just walking around with your hands folded, you look yeah. a little bit out of place. Yeah. Put a drink in your hand, everything is fine. Yeah, yeah. I've got that camera. It's my safety blanket. <laughs> well, have a, a safe trip home tomorrow. Great Thank to speak you to you. Much. And I'm sure because I know you just can't leave Scotland alone. I'm sure we'll be seeing you <laughs> up in our neck of the woods again soon. I'm sure we will be back. So. All right, yeah. great, Sarah. Merry have Christmas a good, yes, too. have a good Christmas yeah. and New Year. And you too, Adam. <laughs> and that is it. That's the podcast finished. 2018, 2018 done. 2018 done. Have a great Christmas, everyone. And have a great if, New Year. If you're listening after Christmas, then I hope you had a good Christmas. And if you're halfway through summer next year because you've, <laughs> you've just got into the show, then it's almost Christmas again. So uh, that's the beauty of a podcast that you can listen to anytime. Anywhere. And, and that's anywhere. why I think the number one rule of podcasting is you don't talk about like specific times and dates unless you have to. Which um, we break all the time. Yeah, we break all the time because we don't actually care because you guys <laughs> you guys actually know what we're talking about. You're smart And, and you're smart loads people. of you actually listen when the podcast yeah, goes out, so it's all relevant. A vast majority of you listen. Uh, but if you are new to this podcast, then there is loads of different ways to listen. Uh, I've actually last week I had to show someone a new way, and they were like, "That's genius," because they, they were struggling to listen to the podcast. And then I told them it was on Spotify, and that made their life a lot easier. Uh, so it is on Spotify, which is the easy one. You can sign up; it's free. Uh, you also get some free music with it, which is a bonus. Uh, there's I don't think there's any ads, uh, but even if there is, it's insignificant amount of ads. I don't think there's any while ads you're listening. On I don't think there is on podcasts, so you're you're all good there. Uh, there's iTunes, of course. You'll have that on your any Apple device. You'll have your native podcast app. There is Podcast Addict, which I've seen a few times on people's phones. On Android, that seems to work really well. There is uh, Podbean. Uh, there's also iHeartRadio. There's a new one that's just launched, but uh, I need to check if we're on it yet, called Pandora. Hmm. Uh, apparently, it's a big one in the United States. So I'm going to double check we're on there. We're also on Amazon Alexa, so uh, it's run through TuneIn Radio, and all you need to say is, Alexa, play Pace Brothers Into the Wilderness podcast, and it will just start playing the latest episode, in theory, hopefully. It does on mine, anyway. So, I think There's no excuse for not listening, basically. If you were traditionally a SoundCloud user, 
I don't think the last. Well, you won't be listening to this if you uh, if you are relying on SoundCloud. But uh, I don't think the last six or seven podcasts have even gone up. We need to sort the issue out on SoundCloud. Uh, we stopped paying for it because it was ridiculous. It was it was a ridiculous amount of money for for not a huge amount of people actually using that platform. It was mainly people on computers that were listening. To In which it. case, you can listen on YouTube. On YouTube, it's or up, anywhere, on, on actually. Facebook. Yeah. It's it's on all of them. Yeah. If uh, if you want our social media pages, it is podcast into the wilderness on Facebook, and on Instagram it's just pace underscore brothers. And the websites thepacebrothers.com. The, the pacebrothers.com, nice and easy. Or if you just Google the Pace Brothers, and the email address to contact us is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. The links will be in the description of the show. And we look forward to bringing you a brand new show at the start of 2019. Until then, thank you.